All right. It is 8.30 Pacific, 11.30 Eastern. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Stop sharing my screen. Um, my name is Grace. I'm with Project APSM. I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2022 Indoor Storage Conference. Thank you all for joining us today. Project APSM is a nonprofit whose mission is to fund research and efforts to improve honeybee health. We are excited to have exceeded $10 million in funded research this year, some of which has gone towards indoor storage research and resources that you'll see today. <clears throat> I just have a few housekeeping items. Um, for our researchers and panelists, if you have a question, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We also have a list of pre-submitted questions from your registration forms. And this meeting is being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole thing, don't worry, we'll share it with you later. And now I'd like to turn it over to our executive director, Danielle Downey. Thanks, Grace. Well, um, I'm glad I made it here. I am joining you from an airport where I, uh, I just left the Idaho beekeepers meeting and it was really great to see everybody. And uh, many of them were part of this event last year and are also part of it this year. So um, it was good to see everybody in person. Unfortunately, it's a pretty risky time to travel and I, uh, a blizzard got in my way to get home. So I'm joining you from the Denver airport and uh, hopefully I'll get home after this. But if I get lost or if you can't hear me, that's why. But I'll make it quick. Um, we are really excited to bring you this event. I think indoor storage is a very promising investment for beekeepers that they're seeing the returns on. And although we fund a lot of research, 10 million is a big number. It's not enough to just fund research. Um, we need to share the results. We need to find applied ways that are actionable for the end user. And we need to communicate those results so that beekeepers can benefit from it. So having these online events is a, a big effort for us to deliver that to the end user beekeeper. So thank you for being here. Um, share this with others if you think it's good. Um, it's nice to have it online to reference whenever you want to go back to it. So uh, we also, so we're, we're looking forward to having research updates about indoor storage. Um, we've brought you the best leaders that we could find to share the, the state of their science. But we also think it's important for you to hear from other beekeepers who are having success with these techniques. And so last year we were in Idaho and this year we're going to go down to California to warm weather indoor storage uses uh, to benefit management in the heat. So we're excited to see that. It turned out really well and I know you're going to enjoy it. And I also want to acknowledge that the Almond Board has helped bring this to you and make it possible. And they are an excellent partner in recognizing that we need advances to keep making gains and help these businesses be reliable partners to each other. Almond growers are also struggling. So uh, I hope that you'll get a lot out of this and thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Grace, to get us started. Great, thank you, Danielle. Okay, I am super excited to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Gloria DeGrandi Hoffman. Do Dr. Gloria DeGrandi Hoffman is the leader of the USDA Carl Hayden B Research Center in Tucson, Arizona. Gloria is also leading a USDA grand challenge on climate change and is a leader in honeybee research studying nutrition, varroa, many aspects of honeybee health and indoor storage. Today, Gloria will be sharing with us her work on Nosema in indoor storage. And with that, I think I will turn it over to you, Gloria. Okay, thank you, Grace. It's great to see you. Great to uh, see you too, Daniela. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen? I cannot see it. No, yet. we see you, Gloria. Okay. Uh, let me get back here then. Okay. 
There you go. All right. So everybody can uh, can see this. Is that right? Yep. Okay, great. So um, before I get started, because once I get started, I usually get too excited and I forget this. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody who made this work possible. Um, these folks in this picture, Henry Graham, Mona Chambers, Lucy Snyder, Emily Watkins de Jong, collected every bit of data that I'm going to show today. And all the data that has been collected at this point on cold storage. Uh, so this involved uh, many trips up to North Dakota and over to California. During the pandemic, these guys drove from Tucson to North Dakota. So, uh, and back a couple of times. So, you know, there's there's great dedication to this project at our lab and and, and we have great folks working on it. And I, I just want you to be aware of, of that and, you know, to how grateful I am to them um, because it wouldn't be possible without these folks. Another group this wouldn't be possible without is the Verhoax and Harvest Honey. We use all their colonies, uh, our, all the colonies in our study are all Harvest Honey colonies. And, uh, you know, up in North Dakota, and we follow those colonies from North Dakota and then up to, to cold storage and then down into California. And they are just the most wonderful cooperators. Again, this work, you know, yeah, it takes a lot of people to pull this off. And, uh, uh, Without the Verhooks and, and their generosity uh, to, to let us use their qualities and the communication we have with them, we couldn't do this. And as you might guess, this work is like really expensive. There's a lot of travel that goes on with it and all of that sort of thing. Uh, we've gotten uh, generous funding from USDA APHIS that's also made this uh, possible, as well as our base funds at the uh, Carl Hayden Bee Research Center. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm here telling you all about this, but many hands made this possible. So let me get started with just letting you know where where we are and, and what we have learned so far. And I presented this data last year and at a couple of other conferences. Um, I want to start by saying, you know, I think we all agree that it's really difficult to get colonies uh, through the winter and increasingly difficult to get them through the winter outside. And uh, th this group, and, and I'm, I'm so grateful to be included in this group and, and in this community that's trying to solve this problem together, as, as, as Danielle was saying, you know, uh, it, it's going to take all of us and, and cold storage seems like a, an effective tool moving forward. So I, I started to look at uh, cold storage and, uh, uh, you know, my research program in nutrition and varroa and population dynamics, it was like all these roads sort of led to cold storage. So I, I look at, at um, cold storage as a problem of population dynamics. And, and, you know, that's because that's my hammer and everything looks like a nail. So I, I you know, I look at the colony population dynamics throughout the year and how can we optimize this uh, when we put colonies into cold storage? So when I first started this, there weren't a lot of cold storage facilities that had chilling units in them. They, uh, uh, so beekeepers had to put the colonies in in November, right, when it got cold outside. But the increase in number of cold storage units is, has been great over the last uh, several years. And so now we can put them in whenever we want. Okay, now we can apply population dynamics and, and models that I've built and so forth to see when the, when the model predicted the optimum time to put colonies in cold storage, and it was when brood rearing had ended and all you had was sealed brood in the colony, you'd maximize the number of young bees, and you'd minimize the number of old bees because you'd stop them from foraging too much if you still had warm weather. The earlier, the better, but not too early, but when all you had was sealed brood. So we went up to North Dakota and we took about 300 colonies and put 150 of them into cold storage in October and another 150 in cold storage in November. And what we found was that in terms of percent survival, which, you know, is uh, we used four frames, the percent survival was was pretty similar between the two groups. Frames of brood, and these you know, bees, of course, do make brood while they're in cold storage. 
there was more brood, but just a little bit more brood in the ones in October. But I should mention there were also sealed brood in the ones in October and more sealed brood in the ones in October. So, you know, they started brooding or raising brood earlier in most colonies than the colonies who put it in November. But most importantly, we had about two frames more of bees left in the colony um, when we took them out of cold storage, we put them in in October. And the benefits of the brood, earlier brood rearing and more frames of bees also paid off after almond pollination where we had larger colonies coming out of almonds and those colonies had more brood. So, you know, it looks like October is, is you know, the time and that our timing was right. And so we recommend beekeepers do that. To, um, Look at their colonies when they only have sealed brood, it's time to put them into cold storage. And we also found out, uh, we did uh, some uh, um, diving down into the physiology of the bees. And this is work that I did with Vanessa Corby Harris at our lab, who is a legit insect physiologist. And we looked at uh, you know lipids in the fat bodies of these bees, protein and weight, because fat bodies really connected to whether you had winter bees, winter bees have larger fat bodies. And what we found is that when those bees were in cold storage, they were burning through those lipids. And the amount of lipids they burned through was correlated with the amount of brood they make. So, you know, that's what happens in, in you know, other times of year where, you know, those lipid rich pollens that we feed bees and that are out there on the landscape, along with the protein in the pollens, but the lipids are so important for hypopharyngeal gland growth and, and for brood rearing. And in these bees, there, there was a direct correlation between how much of that lipid they burned through because they, they weren't getting any more while they were in cold storage and their ability to rear brood. And that brood is the cushion to spring dwindling down in, in uh, uh, when the almonds are in bloom, when they're forging in almonds. Another thing we found out is when we sampled these colonies, they had nosema and that the amount of nosema spores that were in those bees prior to cold storage was negatively correlated to their colony size after cold storage. Now these trees were, or these bees were treated for nosema or anything. So, you know, this was without treatment. So this led us to our, you know, next research question. And, and the reason I'm focusing on it is, you know, we had about 80% of our colonies survive and, and somewhat a little less than that that had six frames or more of bees when they came out of cold storage. So, you know, we're losing just, you know, what, four, between three and five frames of bees while they were in cold storage. And, you know, I, I'm trying to, can we do better than that? And what can we do to maybe, you know, have uh, less of a, of a loss? Because we're putting in some really nice looking colonies. No mites in these colonies, we couldn't find mites. Uh, you know, a lot went into keeping these colonies healthy and, and we don't want to lose them you know, frames of bees in cold storage. So our next question was, well, can we improve colony size after cold storage by controlling for nosema? Okay, so let me tell you our story. This is what we did. We had, um, th there were several products out there that uh, beekeepers were using and we were hearing we're, we're good for, you know, nosema. Um, Fumadil, of course, industry standard. Hive alive, honey be healthy. Um, and then also pollen has, you know, um, uh, the ability to uh, uh, you know, have increased immunity in bees. So we just used pollen too. And we thought, okay, why don't we set up an experiment where we test colonies to see what their nosema loads are before and after cold storage. If we treat them with one of these products, you know, we'll have all these groups of colonies in North Dakota and and we're gonna do this, this is how. But then we thought, okay, before we you know, take hundreds of colonies in North Dakota, why don't we do a little cage study and see how this works and uh, uh, take newly emerged bees and feed each of those bees 100,000 nosema spores and put them in these little cages for seven days and feed them sugar syrup that either has fumadil, hive alive, honey bee healthy, or just sugar syrup and just pollen. Then we had a whole nother set of colonies or a whole nother set of bees in cages that we didn't feed any nosema to to get kind of the background nosema. That was our controls. 
So this is what we found was that our controls, like our background nosema, had about a thousand nosema spores. Now these numbers that you see at the top, the 3.43, 4.9, these are, I mean, because we have tens of thousands and sometimes tens of millions of spores, these numbers get really big. So I convert them to their uh, log 10 equivalent. So I get numbers that, for example, if I, if I convert 10,000 to a log 10 equivalent, it, it's four. Um, 100,000, which is what we fed the bees, the log uh, uh, 10 for that is five. So it, it, just, it just makes it a little bit easier to look at. So uh, you can see with the fumadil, we you know fed these bees 100,000 spores and they came out of being in those cages for seven days feeding on fumadil with another 100,000 with 100,000 spores so it didn't kill the spores that we put in there but it didn't let them uh grow either not like honeybee healthy hive alive and pollen did within a week we went from having you know 100,000 spores to having well over 10 million spores in these colonies so you know, after seeing these results in the cages, we thought, okay, you know, we got to change this. We're not going to feed whole colonies uh, anything but fumadil, and uh, because you know we need some colonies that are going to be alive by the time we take them out of cold storage. So, what we did was pivot and got four new treatments, and we decided to focus on what the effects of just you know optimizing nutrition could be versus optimizing nutrition and also treating with fumadil. So we had four treatments up in North Dakota. We had 88 colonies per treatment. The control group was no fumadil and we fed them pure pollen patties. The, you know, all of September and right into they went into cold storage. Second group, same thing, no fumadil, but we fed them a protein supplement that had 4% pollen in it because again, we, we wanted to keep these colonies strong and we're feeding them all of September. And then our two treatment groups with we treat with fumadil and pollen and fumadil and protein supplement. This is what we got. So these are our average nosema spores. Uh, before we went into cold storage, you can see in the black, we had something a little less than 10,000 spores. That was at the beginning of September. By the end of September, we were you know around 100,000 spores in the colonies we didn't treat. The colonies we did treat, you know, we had less than a thousand <clears throat> spores in them, so the fumadil worked really well. So we knocked down the uh, um, nosema before we put the colonies in cold storage. Okay, so what was the payoff of being able to do that? So when we looked at all of the colonies in the four treatment groups, what we found was there wasn't much difference among the colonies, whether we treated for nosema or not, if we look at them, the size of them when they came out of cold storage, that's the, the light gray, at, or um, the white, which is, you know, after almond bloom. So, you know, when we looked at this, it was like, okay, overall, there's not much of a, of a difference, but let's drill down into those individual, you know, groups of colonies that we had. So if we look at colony survival, we had greater survival in the colonies that we fed fumadil. We had about 78%, almost 80% of them, which is what we had last year, that survived um, with four more frames of bees. But we had, you know, 70 to 75% survived that we didn't treat with uh, fumadil. So, you know, there's a little difference, but it's not great. Now, the percentage of colonies that had more than six frames with bees. Now that's where they started to separate themselves a little bit more. We only had about 36% in the untreated, but we had 40 to close to 41, 50% had six frames or more when we treated with uh, Fumadil. And it was interesting, the supplement actually had, supplement with 4% pollen, and it actually did a better than pure pollen when it came to the percentage of colonies with more than six frames of bees. So now going kind of to the next layer of these data, there's a paper that came out in 2020 that uh, uh, reported that until you get to about 10 million spores 
you really don't start to see the effects of nosema. So just seeing some nosema in the colony, you know, they may not be causing reduced longevity in the adult bees or uh, greater chances of colony loss. So we thought, okay, well, let's look at our groups. Because remember, we had 88 colonies and each of these groups was a pretty good sample size. So we could, you know, look within the group to see what was going on. So now if I look at the groups that had Fumadil treatment in them, we didn't have any of those colonies that had 10 million spores in as a matter of fact, 92% of those colonies didn't have any spores in them that we could find before we put them in cold storage. Whereas the colonies we didn't treat, about 12 to 15%, 12 to 14% of those went into cold storage with 10 million or more spores in those colonies. So, you know, we were expecting that these colonies um, are going to have some of the greatest decreases in, in B numbers uh, while they were in cold storage. And, you know, indeed they did. When we looked at them it, 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 as the individual group. So let's just look at the control group that, you know, no, no SEMA treatment fed supplement with 4% pollen. There was a group in that 88 colonies that we never found any no SEMA in those bees. It was about I don't know, about 12 to 13 percent of the colonies had no nosema spores. And they came out of cold storage with 62 percent of the original colony size that they went in. So if we went into cold storage with 10,000 bees, they came out with 6,200 bees. Where if they had um, 10 million spores or more in them, they only came out with 39 percent. There's you know, 10,000 bees going in. It was 3,900 bees coming out. And pollen showed a similar trend, but the ones we fed pollen to, those colonies uh, that had um, 10 million spores in them, we didn't have so many of those uh, bees die. Uh, we only lost about half the colony, but you know we had 60% of the colony still alive after they came out of cold storage if they didn't have any spores. When I took all these data and I pulled them all together, again, we found this correlation between spore number and the size of the colony coming out of cold storage. The more spores they had, the smaller the colony was. This continued, the effects of this nosema continued at, to after almond pollination, where colonies that had 10 million nosema spores in them, as you can see, had two or three fewer frames of bees when they came out of almond pollination than they did um, if they didn't have any spores. So, you know, the uh, um, reduced longevity of those bees coming out of cold storage and then flying and, and pollinating almonds, that's when, you know, those traits really start to manifest themselves because bees are dying faster than they're being made and the colony population goes down and is uh, I'm sure all of you know, you know who, who are beekeepers it could be pretty dramatic the decrease in colony size during almond bloom when they're flying a lot and you got boxes full of short-lived bees. So with all this in mind what we do about nosema. You know I, I looked up okay what does it cost to treat a colony with with uh, fumidil, eleven fifty. Um, you know, you don't count. This is just material cost. So let's say you're going to feed the colonies anyway. So you're just adding eleven fifty to your cost. Well, that's you know, so quite a bit of money when you scale it up. So you know, going back to look at the percentage of colonies averaging more than ten million spores. So you know, you can have say 13 to 14 percent of colonies that are going to have this 10 million spores, at least wise, this was our experience, that we're going to be um, you know, shipping to cold storage, paying cold storage rental fees, taking them out of cold storage, shipping them to California. And th those colonies are going to be pretty small and coming out of almond bloom e even smaller. So you make an investment, you feed everybody, you're benefiting perhaps 
less than 20% of the colonies, unless you've got really bad nosema. So, you know, um, I mean, who knows what your nosema numbers are unless you test them and, and it's worth testing them before you make this decision. It, I think it's also before you make this decision to look at your almond contract, whether you know you have a contract for four or six frames of bees. If it's four frames of bees, I mean, there's some benefit to treating with fumadel, but not quite as great as you know if it's if it's six frames uh, of bees. So you know to make the decision, and all I do is provide information to help do this. And, and there's a lot more information uh, about this that we're, we're still working through. But, um, you know, it, like I say, it's quite an investment putting uh, Fumadil into your colony. And uh, whether it pays off for, um, you know, your operation and, and, you know, what your pollination fees are, um, is going to be, you know, a, a sort of a personal thing. And, and, uh, you know, it's worth penciling in when you make up your management plan and also your your rental contracts that, uh, you know, treating for nosema would be perhaps one of the factors that you'd want to consider with your colony rental fees. So with that, that's about all I have to, to talk about about that. So I'll stop sharing. And Thank you, Gloria. We do have a few minutes for questions, and I just wanted um, to also say how much we appreciate the economic aspect of your analysis and helping beekeepers understand um, what's going to make the most sense for their operation. And we often say healthy bees going into indoor storage for healthy bees coming out of indoor storage and just to underscore what you were saying about testing your nosema levels and, and knowing what you have going in before you make that investment on Fumagillin. So we did have a couple questions in the chat from T's Bees. Uh, this is predominantly nosema CRNA, correct? Um, nosema apis. Nosema well, apis. I, you know, I, I, I I should be careful. It's a combination. That's the safest thing to say, because we didn't do the uh, testing that we needed to do, that we would need to do. To, although Nosema apis is is predominant in, in terms of you know what what we see these days. So, yeah, that's right. I always get the two confused, but that Nosema apis has largely out outplaced Nosema serenae, and I think often we don't even test between the two anymore. And then um, from Clay Otoni, how long between treatment with Humidil B before testing? And then was any retesting done later? Okay, that's a really good question too. Um, we uh, treat, well, all we did was treat once and we treated um, two weeks before we went into cold storage. So we, we sampled them in September, and got their numbers, treated them. And then two weeks after we treated them, it was September 27th, we uh, sampled them again. And uh, those numbers were the pre-cold storage numbers I, I showed you, was two weeks after treatment. And then the colonies went into cold storage first week in October. Great, thank you. And um, we had a question. Do you have any insight on Honey Bee Healthy and Hive Alive, which are two um, supplements, Honey Bee Health supplements, and causes for increased level of nosema? No, I mean, you know, if, if you look at it, pollen did the same thing. So, you know, feeding with either of those, I'm not saying that they encourage nosema formation, because then you can say pollen, you know, the same thing. It's it just they didn't they didn't prevent um, nosema replication in those bees. So they you know they went in with a hundred thousand spores that we fed them and they came out with ten million. And nosema grows like that. I mean they're just it's just I mean not all of you I think who are beekeepers know this how, how it can carry you away. And those two products didn't stop it, and neither did pollen, but fumadil did. That was all that those cage studies showed. I was going to ask, um, 
because I saw that you had the pollen treatment in there. If you could just explain why a beekeeper might mix natural pollen into their nutritional supplement, and if you had any thoughts on why that that may have led to a slight increase in nosema. You know, I, I, I don't know why it caused a, a slight increase in nosema. Um, we have found, though, that, um, you know, pure supplements, um, you know, can increase nosema. When we, <laughs> when we grow nosema spores in our lab, we grow them in bees. And we know the best way to, to grow them in bees is to feed a protein supplement. And then the nosema spores really grow. And we chose 4% to put, put uh, into um, the protein supplement um, because we did a study several years ago that showed that all, all you really needed was about 4% pollen in protein supplements for uh, them to keep bees rearing brood, um, keep uh, um, disease levels low, lower than pure supplement alone. And uh, uh, so that's why we chose that treatment. We had, we had to be careful. We couldn't stress those bees too much. We weren't going to treat them for nosema. We couldn't stress them too much nutritionally because, you know, first of all, the, the Verhoeks wanted to rent these bees you know, after, after cold storage. So, you know, uh, we, we couldn't have come out with, you know, 88 colonies that, or, you know, or more that were in such bad shape that you couldn't rent them. So uh, we stressed them without treating them, but we, we still, I think, supplied reasonable nutrition. Great, thank you. And I think we have time just for one or two more. So um, moving forward, what other products or naturally occurring, naturally occurring substances are you planning on researching? Um, we we don't we don't have any in you know that we're looking at for you know treating nosema or anything. No, no one has approached us really with anything, and um, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, and, and it, it I mean, Fumadil is the only act in town, and that's of course is you know a dangerous place to be with only having one product for uh, for treatment. So um, yeah, no, we don't we don't have any any future plans to to look at that. Um, and I don't know, I mean, that's not, our, our lab doesn't really do that. That's the Beltsville lab who does disease. And so they they may be looking at something else and, and I'm just not aware of it. I know they're looking at things for Varroa and such, but for Nosema, um, yeah, the, the Beltsville lab could probably tell you more about that. I will say too, and I can try to pull this information for attendees, but um, Pam has funded a few projects on alternatives to Fumadil in the hopes of creating a more targeted drug, essentially, um, rather than Fumadil. And so hopefully we'll have more to present on that at a later date. Um, one last question for Gloria, and then Dr. Gloria DeGrandi Hoffman will be joining us later today for our panel as well. Um, Jason Miller asks, that was great info on Nosema. Did you feed it the Fumadil in syrup? And how many times did you administer Fumadil in the feed? Uh, we fed it in uh, syrup, yep. And uh, um, we only did it once. We didn't do it any other time during the summer. We only fed it uh, two weeks before we put it in, put them in cold storage. Um, so yeah, that was it. One treatment. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Gloria. You bet. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Brandon Hopkins, who has helped us organize this conference and will be presenting in a little bit. And he's going to introduce our next presenter. Hi, yeah, thanks, Grace, and uh, thanks, Gloria. That presentation was great. Um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce Kirti, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering at WSU. Uh, she has a great multidisciplinary background um, in agriculture resource management and applied research that uh, translates to supporting stakeholders. Um, and it's been really great to work with her, and I appreciate her willingness to present in in this webinar, because I think the 
the work she's doing related to indoor storage is fantastic and super interesting. So I look forward to, to hearing the talk. Thanks, Kirti. Thank you, Brandon. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, thanks. And um, is it also advancing? Are you seeing the next slide? Yep. Okay, sounds good. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for um, inviting me. And as Brandon said, I'm an agroecosystems modeler. Um, I didn't know much about honeybees or insects at all when we started this work. And I've just got to work with a lot of awesome people who I've listed in the next slide who helped me learn um, more about this. Um, so today I'm, hoping, I'm presenting on some work we just wrapped up recently on climate change impacts on honeybee colony dynamics. And specifically, we also looked at indoor cold storage as a management strategy um, to adapt to these impacts. And this was a fairly large um, group of people who worked on this. I wanted to start out acknowledging Matt Pruett, who did uh, most of the simulations. So this is not a lab experiment um, work. I'll uh, go through the details a little bit later. It's a computational simulation um, work and the results of modeling um, to answer the questions that we are interested in. And so um, th this was funded by the Washington State uh, Department of Agriculture. We will look at multiple, looking at multiple questions related to climate change impacts on perennial crop production. And um, pollinators was one piece that we wanted to focus on. And we were working with um, Vince Jones from the Decision Aid System, who then got us introduced to Gloria, um, who was the previous presenter. And we used Gloria's model on honeybee colony dynamics um, to look at our research questions. And Brandon um, at WSU and also Vanessa, um, who was involved in the prior work that Gloria presented as well. Tobin Northfield from WSU, um, Julian um, and um, Bob as well from consulting companies. And Bob was um, has been working with Gloria for a long time um, in terms of building the model that was used for this. So the key questions that we were interested in asking are, you know, what are the current weather-driven honeybee colony dynamics? And our focus was on the Pacific Northwest US um, because of who our funding agency was and also for other reasons that I'll um, get to in a bit. And so what are the current dynamics and how are they expected to change in the future with projected changes in temperature primarily, but also in precipitation and other weather related um, factors? And what are the management implications of these projected changes and how cold storage can help? Um, so I wanted to start out with a summary of our findings and get into the details of it. So what we saw was, um, through this modeling exercise that there's an increased risk of honeybee colony failure due to warmer autumns and springs. That's the specific piece that we were trying to isolate. And then indoor cold, cold storage worked quite well in addressing these risks and is likely to play an increasing critical role in the future. We already see increased adoption of cold storage and I uh, and I know there's been prior work that showed that this can be um, economically uh, more promising as compared to not using this either. But in addition to all of that, um, weather itself can be another reason why this might pay off and play an increasingly critical role in the future. So we'll go through some of those results. But before that, just a little bit of background. Um, the study area that we focused on um, is in the top left piece. I'm trying to see if I can find the, um, the flash. 
the the LED pointer here. I can't quite find it. That's okay. I'll just use. So the a case study area here is the Northwest US, so Washington, Idaho, and Oregon uh, parts, and we used gridded. Um, weather products at a four kilometer resolution that covers this entire gray extent here. And on the right side here, there's a figure that overlays the crop um, um, data layers. And uh, what's shown in black here is the crop extent uh, with crops that are pollinator dependent. So a significant large, uh, a significant portion of the crops grown in this area in terms uh, are dependent on pollinators. Um, and then it's also showing uh, the variation in elevation. So obviously there's a difference in latitude and therefore the weather, but also elevation, um, which also plays a part in the weather. So this is an area with a lot of diversity in climatic conditions, and we should be able to pick up a breadth or range of responses to different kinds of weather, which is what we are interested in. A little bit of climate change background um, in case this is something you haven't heard of before. Um, with climate change, we are looking at increased greenhouse gases in the future, which lead to um, what's called global warming or increases in average temperatures on a global scale, uh, which is the change in climate. And we primarily look at projected changes to temperatures and precipitation. Uh, as we all know, the future is uncertain. We don't know what kind of um, uh, decisions human will make, what our energy sources might be, how much, um, what kind of population growth um, can happen in different places, how places can trade energy with each other. There's a lot of uncertainty there. So to deal with that, what we do is we do a lot of simulations to get a range of projected uh, uh, future pathways. And the important thing to note here is what's done here is not a prediction. The idea is not to predict what's going to happen in the year 2050, but it's more projection. So we look at scenarios of future events and then um, try and give a number or numerical value to what the implications of those future events might be in terms of changes in climate. And so we look at uh, what are called multiple uh, representative greenhouse gas concentration pathways. And we we'll look at that in the next slide. But all that is is different assumptions of population growth, um, GDP growth, um, energy sources, how people trade with each other, basically all of which translates to how much greenhouse gases are emitted and where and uh, from what kind of sources. And those are then translated to changes in climate. So there are many, many different scenarios like that um, uh, that are modeled. And typically in climate change impact results, you'll see two of those RCPs presented. We have them in our results too. So I just wanted to bring that up. We have RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. The second one relates to higher projected increases in temperature because it assumes uh, no climate mitigation that uh, nowhere in the world, nobody takes steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there's multiple end results of that particular scenario. And what we call RCP 8.5 is like a worst case scenario of that. So it's an upper end of a no climate policy kind of scenario. And RCP 4.5 is at the other end. We want to get ranges and build envelopes around that. So with RCP 4.5, we assume reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, especially post mid-century. And you see reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and therefore lower temperature increases. And within each of these, and there are other scenarios too that we haven't used. And within each of these scenarios of the future, we have multiple models of the ocean systems and atmospheric systems and how they translate greenhouse gases to um, temperatures. And we uh, use results from about 20 models each um, from the two RCP scenarios. 
so this slide is showing um, the representative concentration pathways, the, the greenhouse gas and CO2 equivalents. That's what's on the Y axis and on the X axis of time into the future. And we typically do projections up till the end of the century 2100. And this is what I was saying. There's a huge spread in the expected um, greenhouse gases, depending on what scenario we assume in the future. And our results that we show here are based on this upper extreme RCP 8.5 and the RCP 4.5 here. And you know, the, what actually happens in the future could very well be somewhere in between as well. And so with these changes in greenhouse gases, they result in changes in temperature. And uh, even with global warming, there might be differences in what these mean for different parts of the world and at different time frames. And since we are interested in the Pacific Northwest, this is those climate change projections translated just for the Pacific Northwest uh, region. And there, there are the two RCPs that I uh, mentioned here, and this goes from historically and into the future. Even historically, you see a spread in the results. What happened in reality is, um, you know, this middle um, uh, line here that's close to the zero because um, the y-axis here is temperature anomaly or change in temperature. So change in temperature historically as compared to historical time frame should be zero. But you see a spread around there and that's where the different models come in. Obviously, different models um, have different strengths. Some do well at simulating the path, some don't do as well um, in simulating the path. So you see a spread in anomalies, plus minus one degrees. But if you extend them out into the future, again, you'll see a spread in future um, warming. And the top block is the higher temperature increase, RCP 8.5 and then RCP 4.5. That's the temperature increases. Um, so in spite of the uncertainty, one thing that's clear if we look at the trends, which is the solid lines, is you know, we expect the temperature to increase. We may not know exactly how much, but that increasing trend is pretty clear. If you look at precipitation, on the other hand, for the Pacific Northwest, you see that you know, the envelope is around uh, zero throughout. And so, yes, there's a small overall increase in precipitation expected, but there's a lot more uncertainty around those projections. And there are about 40% of the models that project um, decreases in precipitation and others that project increases in precipitation. And we don't know um, exactly because the signal is not as robust as with temperatures. And so, so those were the changes in temperatures. And before we get to pollinators, when we talk about climate change and ag, like what do we normally see in literature? Most of the work is around climate change impacts on crops and crop production and yields themselves. There's very little work with respect to uh, pests or pollinators or diseases. But some of what we know about crops can translate to other organisms too. So I just have a brief summary here. So in terms of climate change impacts on ag, we usually talk about two things. One is the effect of elevated CO2 levels in the future that's generally expected to have a positive effect on crop yields from multiple work and it's consistent and it's through increased photosynthesis. Another added benefit is higher water use efficiency. So in rain fed crops, um, you're less impacted by droughts because of this higher water use efficiency potentially. But there's negative effects too. Um, elevated CO2 levels benefit not just crops, but weeds too. And then these positive effects, they can be moderated by nutrient limitations or interactions between CO2 and temperature, and we don't know much about that. There's also quality issues that have been noted as in like lower protein content or micronutrients. Um, and then uh, with higher water use efficiency, the other negative thing is it means you could have less evaporative cooling to combat heat stress, for example. 
And then, so that's the CO2 with elevated temperatures. On the other hand, we generally expect a negative effect. Um, so, uh, because of um, changes to the crop growth and growing season. So you have a longer available frost free growing season, but a shorter time to maturity because of accelerated growth under higher temperatures. And that typically leads to reduction in um, yields, earlier blooming, things like that. Um, then uh, with higher temperatures, uh, more uh, precipitation as as rain rather than snow. So you have water availability issues and heat stress and other issues like cold hardiness, um, not enough cold hardiness or insufficient chill accumulation. But again, positive effects are possible too because there's optimal temperature ranges for crops, not one single temperature. And you could begin, increase depends on where you began from. You could begin in suboptimal temperatures and have positives. And so the only thing I wanted to say here is these are kind of complex effects um, and multiple trade-offs with positive and negative effects. So the net effect is sometimes um, hard to see. But as I noted, you know, all of this existing work, it's mainly focused on crop production. And there's very little we know about pollinators, pests, or diseases. And you know, within this group, we know how important pollinators are for agriculture. And even within pollinators, much of the climate change work, it's really focused on wild pollinators and not managed pollinators, that's honeybees. And um, within that body of work, typically people look at species range shifts. So with changing temperatures, are insects or pollinators spreading to different areas because current areas are unsuitable? Or maybe winter mortality is less and they are able to now um, uh, be more prevalent in the areas that they currently are. And then uh, because crops and pollinators are tightly related, people look at plant pollinator interaction too, is the timing of food availability for foragers changing what kind of impact does that have on species species range um, shifts? Um, but we want to focus on managed pollinators because those are um, important. We also want to focus on, um, uh, so usually with the crop modeling, most of the focus is on the growing season or you look at extreme events like drought or heat, but even subtle changes in temperature can matter. And that's basically what we are looking at with the modeling that we are focusing on. So what we do is we take the model that um, Gloria and team had developed. It's the Varroa population model that includes a honeybee population dynamics and also um, the Varroa mite, but we only work with the honeybee colony, colony dynamics part of that model. And so in that model, there's multiple components that simulate the actual population growth but two primary things. So it's the queen's, so just as in reality, as you all um, know, like it's the queen's reproductive state and the worker population, both that determine the colony's ability to rear uh, brood and um, result in growth in colony. But because um, brood rearing, you need enough of a worker population to rear brood, that colony um, population also impacts the brood rearing ability. So it's an interdependent feedback cyclical thing, which is accounted for in the model. And the model accounts for the queen's age and weather and photo period and colony resources and accounts for the seasonal dynamics in colony size and um, and models the colony population as eggs and larvae and capped brood and adults and within adults separates into drones and workers and uh, within workers, the young bees and the foragers that Gloria alluded to earlier. And this is a model that's been tested in multiple geographies. And so here's an example figure here, just to show that the model is accounting for the important um, seasonal dynamics. So on the y-axis here is the colony population and on the x-axis is the seasons. And the population is divided into three groups here. Um, it's showing the brood size. And on top of that, the young bees that have not foraged yet, the size of that is stacked. And then the foragers on top. 
And so you can see how um, in fall brood rearing kind of stops and um, especially in a, re in, in a region like the Pacific Northwest, right? That's what this is called. Brood rearing stops in the winter, picks back up in spring. And in spring, um, what you see here in terms of the worker population is primarily the population from the prior autumn. And that population is decreasing as they forage. And we want this decrease um, to be smaller relative to uh, how the brood is uh, picking up so that the colony is able to <coughs> withstand spring dwindling and result in increasing populations. And the model is able to capture those general dynamics. And so with that, here's the results of our climate change impacts. Um, there's a few different things here. The top row is RCP 4.5, lower temperature increase, and the bottom row is RCP 8.5. And we look at multiple time frames into the future, the 2040s, 60s, and 80s. And then here's the historical time period. And on the x-axis here is the flight conducive hours of the overwintering bee, so between November and um, January. So historically, very minimal flight conducive hours um, in that time period. And the flight conducive hours are determined as a function of temperature. Um, there should be no rain um, and wind speed is another factor. So looking at all of that very minimal or no um, flight conducive hours in fall. But as you go out into the future, you start seeing more red or more hours. So more flight conducive hours in the fall that didn't exist earlier. So you're going into the winter as bees that have put in more flight hours and are physiologically older. And so that results in um, the minimum colony size in the next spring, um, reducing quite a bit. So here what's shown is the change in the annual minimum colony size. The deeper reds means more decreases. And again, RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. And you see many parts of the Northwest are seeing large decreases in colony size. And we should, uh, and one other thing to note is what we're simulating is just the weather effect here. No other stressors have been accounted for. And so this is really kind of a best case scenario that's just looking at the weather pieces of it. And in this, we've also highlighted two locations, OMAC and Richland. OMAC, because even with the temperature increases in the future, we don't see much of a change. Whereas in a place like Richland, you see much larger increases in risk. And so looking at why this comes about um, a little bit more in detail, and there's a lot of information here so we can walk through in steps. What this is showing is the overwintering age structure. Um, and Gloria alluded to that a little bit as well. So this is similar to the figure we saw earlier with the months on the x-axis and the population on the y-axis and three different time frames, uh, three different, um, the historical time frame, and then the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 scenarios are shown. And this is for the end of the century as kind of an extreme. Um, scenario. So in a place like Richland where we see impacts, this is basically what happens in the winter time frame when brood rearing stops, there's no flight hours and the colony population is fairly um, stable for about 12 weeks in the winter. But as the temperature warms, that drops significantly and you're seeing more flight and aging um, of bees in that time frame, and in with the extreme RCP 8.5 scenario, really no um, time of stable populations at all. So that's a place like Richland. And instead, if you look at a place like OMAC, which didn't see much of a change, we see again, you know, yes, there's a reduction in the time when there's no flight weather and the population is stable, but you know, not uh, so much that it impacts the colony size or its ability to withstand um, spring <coughs> uh, spring colony um, decreases. The colony is able to come back up strong again. 
and here's another um, version of that figure. We we talk about how we talked about how it's important for the colonies going into the fall um, with a larger proportion of young bees, so they can withstand the spring dwindling process. And what we are seeing here in a place like Richland is a reduction in the proportion of young adults, which is uh, leading to the issues um, that we saw. Then we did a couple of, we modeled a couple of cold storage um, simulations. So the, fur, the leftmost part is the colony dynamics with no cold storage in Richland. So in the extreme case, we wanted to see if cold storage helps. And then two different versions of cold storage simulations. One where the colonies are introduced in cold storage mid-October and then removed on Jan 31st so they can make the trip to California to pollinate almonds and another where they are kept in cold storage um, longer. So you can see how um, in cold storage, temperature controlled cold storage, we are freezing the colony <clears throat> in kind of healthy young adult, uh, young bee um, population sizes. And therefore, when they come out, of cold storage in spring, they are able to come back up and not see drastic um, reductions in minimum colony sizes um, that we see here um, in the uh, no cold storage uh, scenario. So cold storage works well. It obviously works better when you leave them in cold storage longer until after brood rearing picks up. Um, and it's less effective here, but still more effective than not putting the bees in cold storage. So it's, this is likely to play an increasingly critical role for weather related management uh, because it seems to be working well. So just as a summary, I think what we learned was weather related risks exist even in the absence of other stressors, but so do management opportunities. And you know, it's really a double whammy in terms of warmer autumns, which lead to a population that's skewed towards older bees that have foraged um, versus uh, warmer and also with warmer springs where um, the flight weather starts earlier too. And you know, as I said, cold storage works well. But there are questions that remain like, you know, what's the optimal time for placing bees in cold storage as early as possible when there are winter bees. But, you know, what makes a winter bee? How does the latitude and environmental conditions result in, you know, what is a winter bee? There's unknowns around that that we still need to learn. You know, and how does this vary spatially and year to year? And, you know, how do extremes, that is, you know, probability of sequential events warmer falls and warmer springs like uh, uh, those can be more damaging so what's the probability of those kinds of events for that we need to analyze other climate data sets that are more amenable for probabilistic analysis and that's something we rarely do in climate change impacts so those are things we need to look at uh, more so that's what we had and you know, happy for feedback and discussion and Gloria and um, um, Brandon and others on the call should be able to um, join the discussion as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Raja Gopalan. Um, that was such an interesting presentation. And of course, modeling, um, when I think about it, it just makes me think preparing for the future. And um, beekeepers might be wondering if indoor storage makes sense for them as a practice in their region. And they might live somewhere currently where they have a true cold winter and they get that long brood break and hibernation period. And as the climate changes, it's important to understand how those dynamics could change. Um, so thank you very much for the work that you're doing. And we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and you all will of course be joining us for the panel later as well. I see um, George has his hand raised. So I'm gonna try to allow George to ask his question. So George, if you're still there, I think you're on mute, but you should be able to unmute yourself. 
Can you hear that now? Uh, that was in, inadvertent. I'm sorry. I did not have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good test. So thank you, George. <laughs> so if there are any questions um, for Dr. Raja Gopalan at the moment, put them in the Q and A. Um, I guess while we have time, I want to try to sum up some of what what you were saying, just to make sure. Um, understanding. So as in these scenarios, we're looking at essentially more flight days later into the season that are leading to act more active colonies and less of that hibernation period, which is essentially resulting in smaller colonies overall in the spring. Is, is that an accurate takeaway? I, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So that, and then in you know, warmer weather in spring too, that adds on to it. And maybe Gloria and Brandon have something to add as well. Yeah, Gloria and Brandon, if you want to jump in, feel free. And we do have um, a few questions popping up in the chat. Sure. So, yeah, and I see George raised his hand again. I don't. He, I think <laughs> this, this time, do you have a real question, George? Yeah, I really do. Okay. Good. <laughs> So I guess um, certainly not being an expert on this, it seems like what I'm understanding about climate change is that on average, and your model is is dealing with the difference in average. But you know when when it's uh, supposedly getting warmer, you know the the person on the street is looking outside and it's snowing like it's never snowed before, and so whatever happened to the global warming part of it, you know? So I'm wondering where it's more extremes, but on the average, it's, it's different. And I'm wondering how does a model take into consideration that kind of, um, that's anecdotal, but I think it's actually um, been verified. It's, it's the average is definitely, you know, there's warming, but the, uh, it, in the meantime, we have all these uh, weird violent, um, uh, events. So uh, how does the model take that into consideration? Yeah, I, I think th that's a great question that comes up in multiple contexts. And, and you're right that what we are um, looking at here is really the response to average increases in temperature, right? And we do account for a range around it because we are, our model is simulating temperatures from now uh, looking out multiple decades into the future, right? And so there's a range of temperature increases and responses to that that comes within that. But really what you're saying is, you know, what matters from a practical management perspective is the natural variability around that warming that people experience. One year is different from the other. That's where I think we need to, to answer that question right, we need to start working with more data because we that that's when probabilities come in, like what's the likelihood of a sudden cold snap and things like that. And for that, we need a lot more simulations. And because we have limited ability to do simulations, most of the climate change work it work is using what's called limited ensemble. So for each model, I said we use 20 models. We use one climate realization of that model. But now we have data sets that do hundreds of realizations of those models. So it's a lot more simulations, but we have those data sets now. That's our next step in terms of climate change modeling in general, to look at variability around that increasing uh, trend, which is important from a management perspective. Great, thank you. And um, from Tim Hyatt in the chat, it looks like higher elevations have little change after climate change. Are you saying temperatures won't rise in those places or that the floral growing season won't be affected? Yeah, um, so I, I think with higher elevations, what we are seeing is not that temperatures don't change there. This is average increases in temperature. So they do increase at higher elevations too. What's different is where they start from. So depending on where you are historically and the baseline from which you are increasing, the increase is not enough 
to have a negative response. So there's some spaces where you are at this critical threshold where small increases put you off on a downward spiral, whereas in others, you don't see that kind of an impact. So that's what's happening um, in, the, um, in the higher elevation regions. So not so much that there isn't an increase. And then with respect to the floral um, timing, that, that also changes everywhere. But again, depending on where you are starting from, you may or may not see a change in bloom time. If you look at observational records and literature, some places see advances in bloom. Some places see um, delays in bloom, others see no change at all. And it's all a function of where you start from and whether you are at a place where your um, bloom and phenology is dictated, uh, how much of it is dictated by just forcing in the spring versus also how the winter time period affects chill accumulation and things like that. So it can get kind of complex. Great, thank you. And I do see this question about um, the timing after fall goldenrod flow and putting bees into cold storage. And I might save that for the panel discussion. Um, we have several questions for our researchers around the timing of when to put bees into cold storage and it varies by region. Um, and some of you have done some work on that and the regional differences. So we might save that one for the panel. Um, so I think now we will transition to our next researcher presentation with Dr. Brandon Hopkins, of Washington State University. Um, Brandon has done a lot of applied honeybee research as it relates to indoor storage, as well as varroa control and queen production and banking. And he is going to present some updates on his research for us today. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Brandon. Well, thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. good yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm sorry, Danielle, that you didn't make it home. We were both at that meeting, and um, I made it home safe and sound, and everything's great. So I'm sorry that I'm sorry that you didn't. I feel bad, and hopefully you made it home, George. Um, so yeah, I appreciate uh, you helping organize all this, Grace, and um, happy to to share my presentation today. Um, I will uh, preface it a little bit by. Um, saying that I looked back at what I presented last year and kind of kicked myself a little bit because I seem to have presented like everything and the kitchen sink uh, that we've been doing on indoor storage. So not leaving a whole lot of uh, new material to present today. And so um, there is there is some new stuff that I didn't present last year. Um, and so a lot of what I'll be doing is um, I don't, uh, presenting stuff that I consider like or hope that will uh, sim stimulate some conversation and some thought um, about aspects I think you know need additional research and uh, consideration uh, for improvements in indoor storage and, and things to be cautious of. And so I'm mainly going to be talking about um, indoor wintering, really around this this issue of CO2, and then uh, uh, this idea of spring or summertime brood breaks, in the hopes to kind of uh, get the ball rolling on that idea. Because you'll see, uh, I think tomorrow, uh, the the video that we produced with Project APSM and Brian Ashurst on the use of his facilities for for these brood breaks, um, and so. Yeah, most of you that are on here are either doing this or are very interested in this indoor storage for the winter time or, or maybe exploring other uses of these storage facilities. Um, but a lot of this I put in here, you know, they all as an alternative to, to wintering outdoors. And so it's amazing how kind of regionally uh, specific or like regionally focused you can get sometimes. So I often just say, you know, indoor versus holding yards in California. Um, but I've really been, you know, realizing that there's also beekeepers that are making this decision of indoor versus outdoors in Texas. And then this summer realizing people are really 
at this point of making the decision of wintering outdoors. Uh, I mean, wintering indoors or wintering outdoors, like in Florida, for example. So I can see, you know, the spread of this or that decision making is kind of spreading um, across the country in in where they winter their bees. Um, and a large part, you know, because of this concept of reducing inputs um, and things like, you know, improved uh, health and disease uh, control when they're stored indoors. Um, and we shared this last year, but it just, I thought of it again, because we just came from this Idaho meeting last year. And it's, it's amazing how many colonies now come out of Idaho. The Idaho Department of Agriculture said that there are 119,000 registered colonies in the state of Idaho. Um, and so it's not, you know, but there's 400,000 colonies, more than 400,000 colonies that are trucked into California for almond pollination. So, um, you know, more than twice as many bees, almost almost four times as many bees um, are coming out of high Idaho than are actually, you know, registered Idaho colonies. So it's pretty amazing how Idaho has become kind of the center for this use of indoor storage. Uh, this is some material that we're preparing for publication, and so I, I think it's okay to share now. And so this is data from the Be Informed Partnership, who um, helped us in a, a big way with our multi-year study of comparing indoor uh, storage versus outdoor uh, storage in California. Um, and so this is from their, their full survey, and this just kind of shows... I hope the trend in the, the use of indoor storage. So in the yellow bars is people responding that, you know, true, they do store bees indoors versus false would be, you know, that they don't store um, indoors. And so these are just among the commercial beekeepers. And so it's now the most recent data here is from 2020, but 29% of beekeepers are, are storing bees indoors. Um, and I think, you know, we'll continue to see that trend tick up. As I said, more beekeepers, uh, across the country more in the Midwest are starting to adopt this practice as well. Um, this I thought was interesting. So there's no difference. There's no statistical difference in commercial beekeepers summer loss or their winter loss if they store indoors or not. And so the gray bars are saying they do not store indoors, whereas yellow is they do store indoors. Um, but you can see there is you know somewhat of a trend, at least in the winter losses. Um, I always, you know, say, shouldn't be saying things like this, the, a trend, considering that's not statistically significant. Um, but it, it does appear that there's the potential that on a, on a larger scale, beekeepers that are practicing this indoor storage uh, might be losing fewer bees in the winter, which is always exciting to, to see. Okay, so um, this is the part where I get in, to a sort of a less structured discussion or, um, and these are just sort of my uh, wild thoughts about these CO2 issues. And this is a, in a large part because this question comes up a lot from, from beekeepers. So every year I get text messages and emails about uh, the CO2 levels in these indoor storage buildings. And I always feel awful because I don't really know and I don't have the answers. And so I thought I would kind of share maybe a little bit about why that's kind of a difficult question, um, what we do know and kind of don't know about the CO2 levels. And so to start with, I just want, you know, most of you on this call kind of understand this, this age-based polyethism where these new bees that just emerge perform these duties and then as they age um, they perform perform the next duties so starting with you know these sort of nurse bees and then they progress into these house bees doing these things and then move towards the entrance as guard bees as they age and so uh, when we're talking about indoor storage I think you know learning about and focusing on this concept of winter bees, which are very similar to these nurse bees and trying to keep the bees as young as possible. And you saw some of that in Kirti's talk about the value and importance of the the, eight, the age of those bees. So the, the young bees, we need a large population of young bees to go through the winter. Um, and as they, as there's more foraging, they age out and they become, you know, they progress through this 
these job duties through this wheel here. Um, sorry, I'm gonna get the windows in the way. Um, and so I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what makes these winter bees. So some of the the factors that cause the transition from the production of summer to winter bees is not super well understood. So early work kind of showed that it's likely not due to photo period so much. Um, temperature has some impact, but it's not real clear. Um, it, the more recent work kind of tends to show that it's probably related to this reduced food availability or the forage that's available or coming into the hive, um, along with the, the reduced brood rearing that occurs you know, for a number of reasons late in the season. But the things that are agreed upon is kind of what um, defines a winter bee, and that's this increased lifespan. So a normal summer bee is lifespan is 25 to 40 days, um, and the winter bees have been shown to live 200, 250 days or more. Uh, they also have this elevated hemolymph protein, like patellogenin, for example. Uh, they have larger hypopharyngeal glands and larger fat bodies, uh, and they have this decreased juvenile hormone. Um, and so these low levels are found in the young, younger nurse bees. And as those juvenile hormones increase, they move on to these other tasks like foraging and, and et cetera. And so I kind of highlighted that because I want to talk about this idea of juvenile hormone and what we kind of don't know about the impacts of CO2. So I am getting to the CO2 aspect eventually here. Oh, and this is what something else that was in this paper I just thought was interesting. Again, like I said, this a little bit random and uh, not structured, but thought this might be something important for management consideration. And so in this paper about the timing and production of winter bees, uh, the kind of manipulated variable here was they um, were taking colonies and then they were uh, either you know the queen that started the the colony in the spring remained there or they uh, removed the queen and replaced the queen or they removed the queen and replaced her with a virgin you know so there was sort of a, a greater delay in having a productive queen or they removed the queen and allowed them to requeen themselves which was a really long you know a, a long delay in having a a productive queen in the colony and so what they showed is that uh, each of those you know caused a delay in the production of winter bees, each one being worse, right? So if you uh, remove the queen and force them to requeen themselves, they had like a serious delay in production of winter bee, the winter bees. And I just thought this would be something to consider for management decisions. Um, if you are requeening late in the fall, you know, does that, does that mean that we should delay putting those colonies into storage. Like if you do a lot of requeening late in the season, should those be sort of set aside and go into the building last or considered maybe not going into the building to provide them enough time to produce those winter bees? Uh, so I, I thought that was interesting and something that should probably be considered for uh, requeening and uh, indoor storage management. So now these this idea of the CO2. So it's a to me a little bit of a dichotomy. So I'll hopefully be able to explain what I mean by that. And that I think this the management of CO2, the levels of CO2 in the building, I think um, have the potential to be very helpful for indoor wintering, um, but also hold the potential to to cause some problems or potential issues. Uh, so. First of all, what we know is that winter clusters of um, bees or clustering bees in general can uh, tolerate and sort of naturally produce a wide range of CO2 conditions. So it can be anywhere from 0.2 to 9.9% uh, CO2 in those, those winter clusters. But in general, the measured amount of CO2 in a full-size colony in a winter cluster, not in the building, but just outdoors, uh, is usually five to six percent CO2, and then that you know dramatically decreases as you measure CO2 levels uh, further outside that cluster. And uh, you know bees are been shown to you know regulate that CO2 levels uh, throughout the winter and throughout the summer. Even uh, they even 
tend to manage that CO2 cycle uh, throughout the day. Um, and there's, I think, interesting and important aspects to how, bio, how bees use CO2 and regulate that level. Um, but there are some, you know, some of these sort of negative consequences associated with elevated CO2. So, and this is, gets back to finally that, this idea of juvenile hormone and the age of bees. So it's known that bees exposed to CO2 uh, for anesthesia, which is a very high, you know, a lot of times we're talking about 80% to 100% CO2 levels, but usually just over a short period of time um, has been shown that it then forces sort of or causes nurse bees uh, to sort of age out of that level and begin foraging at an early age. Um, and I think that's related to how CO2 can affect these juvenile hormone levels in bees. Uh, the other issue is that CO2 at, even at 10% can cause the spiracles to open and much above that can even cause sort of like almost permanent opening of spiracles in some insects, um, which can cause the insect or the bee to die due to water loss if they can't control their the spherical openings. Um, yeah, and so just as an example of how C temperature and or CO2 affects this juvenile hormone levels, they showed at 35 degrees C and at 1.5% CO2, you get this increase in juvenile hormone, which would make the bee, you know, start to age and move more towards that foraging stage. And at 27 at 1.5% CO2, it remains low, which is very interesting because um, if some of you, oh, let me go back real quick, recognize here that 35 degrees Celsius um, is the brood nest temperature. So this is um, a colony that has brood. They're maintaining that 35 degrees C um, and that elevated CO2 in the brood nest. You see this steady increase in juvenile hormone. Um, but at this lower temperature, 27, is the temperature that like an overwintering hive would maintain like 25 to 27 Celsius when they are not rearing brood. That's the sort of the cluster temperature and that juvenile hormone remains low. So what's not really known is that, so yes, at this lower temperature, the juvenile hormones remain low and the bees say stay young. Um, but if you had that lower temperature, but elevate the CO2, does that drive up juvenile hormone levels? Um, and so that's sort of the, the area of sort of concern or, or thought is um, if we're manipulating the CO2 or allowing the CO2 to rise too much and the bees on that exterior of the cluster, like in the building, but outside the cluster um, so that they can't manipulate the CO2 through ventilation and things, uh, is there the possibility we're causing you know problems with hormone levels in the bees are causing aging issues, um, things like that. So I think that's a, you know, an important area of research that needs to be kind of measured uh, as beekeepers are considering, you know, al allowing CO2 to rise in inside their buildings. Uh, the other very interesting aspect, I think, of this CO2 issue is the, its effect on metabolism in bees. So it's been shown that uh, you know bees naturally you know cause or create or generate the CO2 um, to decrease metabolism in that winter cluster, and that um, allows them to consume less honey and increase lifespan. And so that's a bit of that dichotomy thing. I mean, whereas in some cases it's shown that CO2 increased levels of CO2 can cause aging or increases in juvenile hormone. Um, but it's been shown like in, you know, these natural settings where they increase CO2, it causes an increase in lifespan, but it's not known whether that increase in lifespan is due to decreased metabolism um, or whether it has an impact on that, the juvenile hormone levels. Um, yeah, and it's, so this work is very interesting. I think on a practical purpose, it has um, implications for the honey consumption. And so, you know, if you can help them or drive up CO2 levels, uh, can you decrease the metabolism to the point where they consume less honey? And that means, you know, maybe they need 
less feeding, they can go into the the storage containers with uh, with less honey stores in the in the boxes, or less likely to to starve colonies to death. And so, I think that's a another area that deserves more attention for this practice. Um, our interest in this, you know, came from we marked bees a certain age and put them in and found that this is back to, you know, these winter bees having larger fat bodies or larger hyperpharyngeal glands. And so, whereas we didn't exactly measure the CO2 levels, we did have uh, rooms, indoor storage facilities, so a cold room and a controlled atmosphere. And the controlled atmosphere by nature had lower ventilation, so the CO2 levels um, were higher in those contain those rooms, and so we saw you know increased uh, protein levels, the hyperpharyngeal gland you know being the main one included in that, and we also saw increased fat bodies at this in these controlled atmosphere rooms with uh, with lower ventilation and you know elevated CO two levels compared to the cold room that was highly vent ventilated. Um, so that's sort of the metabolism, um, age structure kind of idea for the CO2. But a lot of the interest in CO2 comes from these two papers, um, you know, from Rob Curry's lab in Canada. They published uh, this work show in 2015 showing that carbon dioxide had the potential to control varroa mites in these storage facilities. Um, and then we published later uh, uh, the similar findings that that CO2 has the potential to increase mortality in varroa mites while they're in storage. So this is uh, the work from uh, Rob Curry's lab. And so this figure in the top left is the average daily mite mortality. And so this is with the restricted ventilation, if you can see at the top here. Um, and what you can see is, you know, while it's up and down on a daily basis, overall the daily mortality is significantly higher than than in this figure down below, where it's fairly steady at this you know very low rate uh, under standard ventilation. And the amazing thing here too is that this is only a 16-day treatment, so they allowed the colonies to stabilize indoors in these chambers, and then. Uh, they reduced ventilation, driving up the CO2 levels for a 16-day period, uh, measuring the daily mite foam. Uh, and uh, there is clearly, you know, elevated mite mortality with uh, higher CO2 levels and restricted ventilation. Um, you know, a different way of looking at this, and this is what we did in, in our work, uh, this is over a 62-day period. And overall, we found that at 8% CO2, so highly restricted ventilation, you know, very high levels of CO2, we had about 74% of the overall mite population uh, die during that 62 day period. Whereas in the control is about 44% of the mites died during that 62 day storage period. All right, so that's for the CO2 stuff. So now just a little bit want to talk about the brood break in anticipation for our panel discussion in the in the video uh, with the Ashurst. And so I presented this last year. Um, and so I'll just quickly kind of go through this. But our experience with this, uh, we've done it at a couple of different times a year. Initially, it was in the fall in August where we created this brood break by putting bees indoors for 18 days. Uh, brought them out and treated them. And I, sorry, it seems to be cut off here, but the, the bar on the left is uh, the group of bees that went through this period of indoor storage received a single application of uh, mite treatment. And then we went back and checked them uh, a month, well, 45 days after that treatment. And the colonies all were well under 100 mites per 100 bees compared to the the colonies that stayed outdoors and received sort of multiple flash treatments of a miticide, uh, the mites continued to, to go up and were much higher than the ones that went through this brood break period. Um, so that led to beekeepers wondering if they could do this at times other than the fall. Could, could you do it earlier in the season, say after almonds or after apples? And so 
We did this again, a very almost the exact same experimental design. I had colonies that went through an indoor brood break and those that stayed outdoors. And so we saw you know similar findings in this case where they it was kind of right after almonds, the colonies were really heavy. They went into an 18 day storage period and then were either treated uh, after being indoors. And then we had a group that remained outdoors and got treated as well. And so we had much better mite control with the group that went through this brood break. Um, so this is stuff now that I didn't present last year. Um, and this is one of these things where I, I do think it's important, but generally, you know, you don't talk about these experiments that get screwed up um, and don't go very well. But this is one of these cases. So we have these indoor storage refrigerated containers. And we were doing this brood break. In this case, it was after tree fruit pollination. So it was a little later in the season. And there was a period of time when this beekeeper, was they weren't quite ready to go to Dakotas for honey production, but they were done with apple pollination. And so it was a period of time when the bees weren't making honey necessarily. They weren't uh, in a pollination set. And so they were you know, kind of a, in a staging area. And so it provided a chance, an 18-day window where we could possibly do uh, this experiment. And so they went into these containers. Um, and so you'll see in the, the following figures that basically what we have is what we called an unstable condition and a stable one. And what that really means is that we had serious refrigeration issues with one of the containers um, that we couldn't really get under control. Um, and it ended up being the, an average of about two degrees Celsius, so colder. But one of the issues was that not only was it was colder, it was like going below freezing for a day or two, and then it would come up and down. And so it was kind of all over the board um, as far as its temperature control. And then we had one of the containers that performed very well and averaged five degrees for that 18 day period. And so what we have here is just the frames of brood. So looking at its effectiveness in uh, causing a brood break. So you have the indoor stables, right? So that's the container that performed as we wanted it to. We have the indoor unstable. That's the container that did not perform like we wanted. And then the amount of brood for these three groups of bees. So after the storage period, you can see that the, the unstable group and the stable both you know, significantly reduce the amount of brood in those colonies. And here's the results from the, the mites. And so this is pre-treatment and post-treatment for these three groups, the indoor stable container, the indoor unstable, and the, the outdoor colonies. Um, and so the data here is a, a little bit messy. The other thing I'll say is we wanted to try two different mite treatments. So one is a, a product that other individuals in the, the WSUB lab group were working on, which was a, a metarizium uh, control for varroa mites. And then the oxalic acid is just the oxalic acid dribble. And so in this case, um, you know, with that unstable, and I'll just say the unstable, if you saw, I'll go back one here. So it, it, was the one with the least amount of brood and i think in part because it like had freeze you know chilled brood it really did uh, quite a number on the colonies they looked kind of the worst coming out of that unstable condition it was a a good example of the importance of having good temperature control on your buildings i can tell you that and so it it removed most of the brood in large part just because of the massive temperature changes in that container. Um, and I think in that case, it also you know, made it somewhat more effective for the oxalic mite treatment and having less brood. Uh, but other than that, it you know this experiment didn't work like we had seen before. Um, and so I think you know this these kinds of things happen. It doesn't always work. But one thing, the, the main thing I wanted to show from this, which is really the lead in into what I think is uh, very interesting and hope you guys identify this or hear you know, Brian say it in the video or at the panel. Um, but is this idea of 
and I don't know, you know, it doesn't have like a clear name, I would say, or I don't know how to describe it the best. Maybe Brian's much better at it, but this idea that the bees that go in for this brood break, um, you know, they go under you know, a lot of stress. They consume a lot of food. It's a difficult period to go from like nice warm temperatures, rearing brood to being like slammed into a cold, dark room for 18 days. And so you have colonies that, you know, died when they're, you know, they die when they're in there. A lot of the colonies, they come out, they're broodless. They don't look particularly great compared to the way they went in. Um, and so it can be sort of a scary situation. You end up pulling a lot of dead outs um, compared to the stuff sitting outdoors, right? Um, but in this case, I'll just say, so, so this percent survival, so this is the starting number of colonies. They go through this 18-day 18, 18 period. We treated them. Then we came back um, to look again at these bees a month later. And then this is the percent survival over here in this column. So kind of ignoring me in this case, the mite control thing or the storage treatment, these are the percent survival. So this figure combines those things. So ignoring the, the mite treatment and combining the colonies that went through this sort of stable indoor storage and the unstable indoor storage versus the colonies that sit outdoors. Um, and I'd said before, especially like in the, the unstable storage container with the very cold temperatures, it was very stressful on the colonies. Uh, they looked the worst by far coming out. I, I didn't think any of them were going to survive. They looked so bad. Um, but they basically, uh, there was no difference in survival, say like a month later, which to me was amazing. And at the time, I didn't even think about it until until Brian had kind of said this, um, is that I think one of the cool things or one of the major important possibilities for this brood break is the, the potential to kind of, to knock some of these colonies in the head. I don't know how the best way to say it, but putting them under the stress, not only to get this, you know, potential for improved varroa control, but one thing you can do is maybe weed out sick or weak colonies that would otherwise die. So in this case, you have outdoor colonies, 43% of them survived. Um, and so you have the same number of colonies dying. It just took them two or three months longer to die, you know? And so then what's the cost, you know, that, what have you invested in those colonies for a couple of months for them to slowly die versus putting them in and, you know, weeding out those uh, sick or weak colonies before you invest a lot of money in in feeding or requeening or treating uh, those colonies. So I thought this was interesting, and I think you know Brian has more you know thoughts to share about that. Uh, but it's something that we saw, and I think it's something that deserves more attention for this brood break concept more than just the the varroa control issue. So yeah, I want. I mean, I really want to thank Project EPSM and the, the Almond Board of California for funding a lot of this work, along with USDA NEFA and Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission and the, the state beekeeping associations from Oregon, Idaho, and California. I guess, yeah, and so Stephen Onayemi, who's doing his PhD now with Doug Walsh, and uh, Kelly Kohanek and Anna Webb for all their help with, with this work. And with that, I'll questions I, i'm happy to try to answer some questions so thank you thanks brandon that was a great update and we do have a few minutes for questions i also just want to say i put into the chat for everybody some links to um, where you can find two indoor storage guides that brandon and kelly worked on um, with us at project apism that have a lot of the ins and outs of indoor storage and also another link with um, to the PAM YouTube channel where you will find the conference recordings from last year. If you're curious about some of the beginnings of some of this research and it's also some how to indoor storage facility videos that we have on there. And we will be sharing our first video touring the Ashurst facility after the break. Um, it'll be an interesting look at 
different ways of using indoor storage beyond just holding the bees at that constant temperature, but what else can these facilities be used for? So I did see um, a question pop up in the chat for you, Brandon. Is the elevated CO2 killing the mites directly or is it just a long brood break? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think they know for sure in the, the work by... Um, by Robert Curry. In that paper, in the discussion section, they propose a few potential um, mechanisms for the increased uh, viral mortality. I think my favorite proposed in that is this idea that the, the CO2 affects the spherical openings. And so mites aren't insects, but they do have sort of, you know, they do have to get oxygen through their exoskeleton and they have a much higher surface to volume ratio. And so they're much more subject to desiccation. And so one possibility is that at that elevated CO2, they have a harder time controlling water loss. And because of that higher surface to volume ratio, they're more subject to desiccation than the bees. And so they're dying from dehydration. So maybe it's indirectly from the co2 but yeah the co2 itself is sort of causing seems to be the causing the issue with um, mortality in varroa so that's my favorite potential answer for that yeah um and let's give a minute to see if any more questions pop up in the chat but i was wondering if you could comment too about the CO2 levels in the building and just the awareness um, for the beekeeper and staff um, of those levels because it you can feel it right when you go into the building. You can feel it yeah it's like you've suddenly gone up to some like high elevation you can feel it like in the in your breathing um, and there are you know serious concerns with you know human safety and things like that with as high uh, a CO2 level as can develop in these buildings that the bees can easily tolerate, but us as you know mammals don't tolerate so so well. And so the you know it's very important to have a lot of monitoring, you know, sensors um, and security so that you know somebody doesn't inadvertently walk in to some CO2 level that could cause them to pass out and and potentially die. Great, thank you. Yeah. I saw it. Do you recommend keeping the over at 27 degrees? I, I'm guessing that's from that, you know, this idea that at 27, the juvenile hormone stuff doesn't increase. Um, and I know I do not recommend you holding your building at 27 degrees. That's, mu that's much too warm. So those temperatures are very specific to the cluster temperature. So inside the center cluster. So in your buildings at four degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit, each of those hives, the clusters are still are maintaining that 27 degree or you know 25 degree temperature um, all on their own. So I, I would recommend you use the industry standard of the four degrees Celsius and let the let the bees do the the 27 degree cluster temperature thing on their own. Great. I think now what we'll do is I'm going to transition to a couple of poll questions and prize giveaways, and then we will have a break. We will premiere that video, and then Dr. Hopkins is joining us again for our panel discussion after the break. So thank you, Brandon. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I am going to launch... Um, question here for our audience, because we would really like to learn about you and who you are and also some of your thoughts on indoor storage. So we would really appreciate it if you could answer for us. So thank you. I see people are answering. I'll just leave it open another minute. Great. All right. Looks like we've got a few people still answering. We so appreciate you sharing this information with us.
And then I'm also going to pop up a slide here to show our prizes. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see this. All right, great. I'm going to end that poll. And I have one more poll question for you today. Oh, let's see. I think I'm trying to do too many things at once. So I'll go back to our prize slide. Okay, so we'll do the poll after the break. And we have some prizes to announce, some prize winners. So I was thinking about how best to do this. And I'm going to call five names that my colleagues selected from those of you who are in attendance today. And I will reach out to you after the conference and we'll choose from these prizes white elephant style. So we have two subscriptions to American Bee Journal available, to Bee Culture available that were donated by both of those magazines. The Almond Board of California has donated assorted blue diamond almonds and two $20 Amazon gift cards. Nick Nut Farms has donated some straight from their farm almonds. And we also have some beautiful greeting cards painted by George Hansen um, in the encaustic method. So our winners are Brooke Decker, Stefan Zauner, Kathy Daniels, John Benham, Terry Dorsey and Adam Packle. And you don't have to do anything right now, but just know that we'll be reaching out to you and that you have won a prize today. So with that, I think we're gonna transition to a break and we will pick back up at 1045 Pacific time um, for that video premiere and our panel discussion on indoor storage. So. Thank you, and we will see you in a bit. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Hopefully, you can all hear and see me. Maybe if one of my other hosts or panelists could confirm for me. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. And Brandon, do you see the video um, pulled up? I do, yeah. OK, great. OK. so. We have a special video premiere for you all today. It is one part of two videos. Um, the next one we'll play tomorrow, touring the Ashurst Bee Company indoor storage facility in the Imperial Valley of California. This is a really unique storage facility and we'll also be hearing from Brian Ashurst in the video and hopefully he'll be joining us for the panel later as well. Um, what I want you to listen out for are the different ways that his company is using this building and this facility. And I also wanna give a special shout out to the Alma Board of California who helped us um, get this video made, and Scott and Shara of Wonderstone Films who produced this video for us. So um, with no further delay, I'm going to hit play on this video and keep my fingers crossed that my internet doesn't slow things down. Brandon Hopkins, uh, assistant research professor at Washington State University. And I'm Brian Ashurst, uh, beekeeper here in Southern California in the Grill Valley. I'm always hitting him up for, for help in doing in these bee projects and you know, bugging him. And I appreciate Brandon's approach to a lot of this because I think he looks at it in the real world, um, what the beekeeper really is looking for and what he needs. My great grandfather, 
was the one who got started. Him and his son, which would be my grandfather. Then my dad and my uncles, now me and the cousins, and, and now the fifth generation's uh, going right now, too. They're buying out the third generation. <laughs> built our first building in 2012. Came out of the necessity for a spring project that we do for making up new hives. And when we built it and got it all working, then we decided, hey, there's other uses for this. So we actually use this room almost year round for something. Right now it just happens to be the brood break thing. I think just in talking to beekeepers, researchers, doing a little thinking on your own, like how are we gonna control my, and then it's really, Brandon was at the same, exact same time was working on this thing and it was like okay this is i think something we need to start investigating so we just we just jumped in head first i'm not afraid to try things let's try and see what happens i mean the level of record keeping that you do i think is amazing and i think probably really helped you see that whereas a lot of guys would have probably taken the bees out after that brood break and even in the first few days or weeks you know it's probably a bit scary you know to see that the the dead outs and just the the colony's smaller or weaker. And so I think one thing that's amazing is your ability to track those and see the them surpass the bees that sat outside. And that takes time. Keep good records. You don't want to just throw all your money in one thing and you don't really know yet. You want to make sure you, it works. So we kept good records on it and kept an eye on it. When you first do it, you're like, I don't know if this is working. There's You're going to get a lot of dead bees right off at the beginning. And you kind of feel like maybe this was a mistake. But in time, keeping watch over that, not only will the cold room surpass in quality strength and all that, but the dead stops. They, they cleaned out all the poor bees. Now you're just left with the good stuff. These bees here came out of uh, our east room, we call it, last night. So that's after three, 18 days. That's right in the center of the hive. There's no eggs. There's no, no larvae. Is there anything there? Yeah, so I mean, to me, I mean, you can see why this would be especially the first time doing it or something like that a little bit troubling. I don't think you see the the big benefit until January. When you're when the bees finally kick back into gear and it's time to get ready for the spring, that's when you really see it. Like they they just take off. Those bees that had to deal with that environment outside, it's hot. They're dealing with that. They're dealing with more pesticide exposure and they are also just never had that reset. They never got cleaned up. So because of that, by the time you get to January, those are all my lower grade hives or the ones that come out of the coal room. They are consistently top notch. Go to the producers who pay, the, pay, pay for good quality bees. It's hard to imagine Varroa mites developing resistance to this practice of brood break because it's a management control it's not a chemical control option you still have all the same choices of chemical control after the brood break to control mites using the rotation of chemicals after a brood break would be a good choice i think it also has the benefit of really reducing the amount of miticides beekeepers have to apply in the hive which benefits the health of the bees and reduces the likelihood of developing resistance if you only have to use a single application after the brood break it's a lot better than applying three or four rounds of that same chemical or applying a long lasting compound in a strip form that's in the hive for two months. So it would greatly reduce the chances, I think, of varroa mites developing resistance by utilizing this. Here's a mite on this bee right here. See, there you go. And that's why we'll treat one more time. There's a mite crawling around on this bee. So yeah, and there's nowhere for those mites to hide. And so you come through with a treatment and it's going to be 97% or better effective. And it's going to be super consistent among all these hives. You don't have to worry about them being at different levels of brood and different levels of effectiveness. The treatment will be consistent. When you're in a hot climate, some of the new things they're working on are acids. It's too hard on the bees. So we have to have another alternative besides some of the other traditional methods of treatment. Um, so I think that's another benefit that you don't even have to worry about temperatures and assets. So when they go in was a little bit of a trial and error. We didn't really know when to put them in. We started off with just a little bit of hives and, and, and seeing what they would do. And uh, we put in older parent colonies. We put in package bees, put in singles. We put in all sorts of stuff. From that, we learned package bees do awesome with doing this, by the way. 
but the parents are the ones that show the most pressure, my pressure, they have the most viral loads and all that. So I crafted it to, okay, only those bees are gonna go inside the room. And then we started looking at, okay, what time frame works the best? We've gone as late as uh, bees coming back from Montana. We put them in in like uh, late October, just to see what would happen if we did that versus earlier on. And what we kind of fell on was, so we do it in, in three rounds. So it's July, 18 days. Now you're in August, 18 days. Then you're in September, 18 days. If I could do it in one big, one time, I'd probably do it all in August because you got to catch it before the mite is actually really getting to going, right? You want to catch it right before that. And then if you can stop it right there, I think then that breeds into success. You go too late in the year, they can't recover from the cold rain. They just don't have time to get going again. So there's a, there's a sweet spot in there you got to find. We settled on 18 days because at one point we were thinking, oh, it's got to go 21 days. Well, 21 can easily turn into 25 because it's the weekend, it's the storm, whatever. And what we found is, you know, 18 days seems to be about right because after that, I think all that brood comes off and they just start eating everything up in the hive. And so then when you bring them out 20, 22, 23 days, they're getting pretty light. For 18 days, you still got plenty of time. There's enough weight to get more feedback on them and get them, get them going again. Yeah. The reason why I think 18 days works is that those bees, when they get in that uh, cold condition with no food, no light after about a day, I think they cannibalize any of the eggs and even maybe some of the, the youngest larva and only rear and hatch off the older larva and cap brood. And so that's why, you know, you get almost completely broodless in less time than a full brood cycle. So I don't think they're rearing them and hatching off the eggs when they get into that condition. And that's a big difference, I think, between the wintering them indoors and this brood break at times not in the winter. As people have said, you know, they may lose, eat like a pound a week or something like that in the winter, but it seems like in there, they're eating like a pound a day or more. I mean, they go through a lot of food when they're in for that 18 days. Well, if you were in the Dakotas, you would be broodless going in. So you've kind of already got the hive in that hibernation winter mode. Here, we're actually stopping it right in the middle and saying, hey, no more brood laying. We're going to just force you into it. But there's still brood in there. There might be six, seven, eight frames of brood, and that's got to hatch, and those bees got to eat. We will treat them before they go in to try to clean up anything we can before it goes in. Um, we used to feed, and then we realized well, they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there and we don't need to do all that. So we stop feeding. We don't do any feed anymore before they go in. We make sure they're heavy. We pull all the honey, everything's done. They're all filled in, they're graded. Uh, if it's not good enough to go in the comb because it's not gonna survive, they get separated out. Only the strong, only the heavy, they're the only ones that can go in. And we do all this early in the morning because it's hot in the day, bring them in. Everything that gets sold, sorted out goes into its own location. And now we work them differently we might start combining them, requeen. Just, it's more like a hospital yard. Um, everything else uh, gets to go in here and get its get its reset. So it'll be warm outside, of course. It's, I mean, it could be 115 in the day and it, at night it's still 105 degrees. And even if the, in August, the humidity starts coming up. So you're dealing with all that. Trucks will come in at night. We don't even put full loads on the truck because that's just more heat created. My guys, we I'll send more trucks than I actually need to send. But that way we can go maybe just too high, kind of space them out on the truck, give them that air movement, you know, for, for as they come in, because the movement itself is a stress. When we bring them in here and you put them inside, the room temperature shoots up, of course, and now you got to bring it back down. You need a lot of horsepower to keep pushing that thing down. And once you can get it down and under control, then the bees finally give up and say, okay, this is what it is. It's cold. Then they'll move into a cluster and uh, they'll, they'll just accept it. So tonight when we come in to get them out, um, or any night we get them out, it's still warm here. So uh, as soon as the door opens, the bees are like anxious to get out. They've been cooped up for 18 days. Uh, they're ready to go. They start coming out of the box. Uh, I'll have a guy there just watering everything down just to keep trying to keep everything cool. We have water tanks in all the trucks. And so when they set the bees down, they'll water them again. Part of that is let everything get soaking wet. Let there be water left. When the morning they wake up, they're going to go looking for water, right? Because there's already some water just on the 
hives and boxes and all that himself, that helps give him some water right off the bat. Yeah, it really makes sense in this case because it's still, what, like 90 out or something right now? Yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah. So having that water is, yeah, a really good idea. Yeah. They get them loaded up as quick as they can. Same deal. We don't put too much on a, on a load. We try to keep it a, a low-level load. There was a story of a beekeeper who did this and put the bees on a truckload and moved them a couple hours from the building and that had not great results. And it could be because it left half the bees on the road. I don't know, but it might be a good idea not maybe to move them long distances right out of the building. That guy had asked you, did they move them in the morning? Yep, in the morning too, I think. Okay, so we do all our moving at night. Everything's, it's sundown, we start and we go all night. The reason we do that is just for, I don't want any sun, any light, they go for it. And yes, we're not going two hours. We're going to go 45 minutes the farthest trip. We get to the field, we'll set them down. The next day, they're going to be flying like crazy. They start kicking out more dead. There's going to be a lot of dead bees on the ground. But don't worry, that's just the bees that died naturally. The hive will be weakened. They'll be dead. There'll be queenlessness. There'll be, there'll be some issues. Okay, so there's a weaker one, right? That one took a little bit of a hit. See, there's another weaker one. They'll be picking that up. And, you know, I do think some of it is they could have been queenless, about to go queenless. Unfortunately, these, these are older queens. You're going to have some that just they're not going to survive. It. And so uh, they might be strong the day you put them in, but this is what accelerates and exposes the issues. And so you're going to have some of that. The thing with this process is, remember this, it doesn't save hives. It just preserves hives. If it was gonna decline in the field, it's gonna decline in here and it's gonna happen fast. So it's a good way to just kind of filter out those problem hives right off the bat, get them out of your way. What it does for me is it saves money because now I'm not feeding bees that are actually just on the decline. Yeah, I think you're one of the first ones that told me about that idea of it killing off these bad bees and that, that being okay. And it, it did make me think, I hear a lot of guys that they're out there and like, oh, well, we'll give it a chance. Or, you know, this thing's like four or five frames of bees and put a new queen in it and give it a chance. And, and that those bees never make it. And then, yeah. you, then you put all that money of a new queen in it. You put the sugar syrup in it and the mite treatments on it and the, the foul brood treatments and everything else on it. And it's still going to die. It's not going to make it. So everything that will survive now will be broodless. Uh, it'll be in a smaller state. We'll come back three, four days later. We want to get a treatment on. We want to get a shot of feed into them to kind of get them going again. All we put is uh, syrup, though. We don't use any pollen. There's no baby bees at this point. Check to see if the queens are laying, and usually she's laying right away. There's eggs here. There's a little bit of eggs in there? A little bit of eggs okay. here. The bees in here are all young, fuzzy, healthy-looking bees. Right? Like, you don't see, I don't know, you don't see those old, greasy, shiny-looking bees in here. We don't worry about it for another two, three weeks. Then we come back and now we put it on our regular schedule of feeding, a regular schedule to keep the hive going. And all you're doing right now is see where it goes. And so uh, our history tells us that a lot of dead up front, maybe a fair amount of dead the next time, but then after that it stabilizes and it pretty much goes really well after that. All right, so that video was hot off the presses. It has not yet even been made public on our YouTube channel, but it will be later today. So now we're gonna transition to our panel discussion. And I would like to invite all of our panelists to turn your cameras on. And um, I, do not see Brian Ashurst in our list right now. So hopefully he'll be able to join us tomorrow. And if I'll ask my other panelists, if you see him before I do to help me promote him to have him join our panel. So we have all of our researchers who presented for us this morning and joining us today is Jason Miller from Miller Honey Farms a commercial beekeeper, as well as Zach Browning from Browning's Honey Company, commercial beekeeper, and a board member at Project APSM. 
And Zach, I want to say a special thanks to you for joining us because I understand you've got some pretty dire weather going on. So if you have to leave us, no worries. Um, but thank you for making it work. Um, okay. So let's just kick this off. So I pulled some questions to get us started from what was submitted by all of you who registered. And we also have our Q&A available. If you raise your hand, we'll also try to call on you. And we have an hour to talk about indoor storage, um, new uses for buildings, and we'll just see where this discussion takes us. I want to invite our panelists as well to ask each other questions and also interrupt me if um, there's something you see that you want to answer. Um, this is meant to be as informative as possible for all. So just to get us started, and that goes for you as well, Danielle, if you um, want to interject any questions, just jump in. So. Uh, I just want to start with kind of a general baseline of what are the current trends in indoor storage? Um, I thought, Brandon, maybe if you could kind of sum it up for us, and then if either of our beekeepers want to say how they use indoor storage themselves. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, Jason or Zach might have a better answer for this. I mean, I guess the general trend is that it's, and I think it's increasing in its use. And then um, I think, I think the use of refrigerated buildings um, is increase, you know, increasing over the old style. But I think there's still a lot of utility in the, you know, the humidicell, the potato storage style buildings. And then, um, you know, I hope or would like to see um, an increase in that the trend of sort of the use, getting more use out of the buildings other than just during the winter storage period. But that's my kind of two cents. Yeah. Um, Zach, maybe if you want to jump in and tell us how you use indoor storage. Oh, let's see. I'm going to you on mute. There we How's go. that? Can you hear me okay. now? All right. I agree with Brandon that there is an increase in, in utilization of winter storage. And we, we see that um, in terms of there's a lot more demand for, for trucking now in, in January, especially coming out of Idaho than, than there ever was before. And I don't know what the percentage of the, the bees that go to pollination now are uh, being stored indoors, but I think that it's rapidly increasing. And I think that's good for the industry. I think it's also good for our partners. Um, we have uh, primarily over the past 30 years used winter storage as a pre-pollination event. Um, but in the last five years, we've been learning to use it as a post-pollination event. So bees are coming back in after almonds because the areas where we keep bees still aren't quite in the swing of, of uh, well, spring. Um, it's it's still cold enough that we can we can move them in there and uh, we use that as a way to reduce um, the varroa load by getting them broodless again. I can talk more about that later, but that's certainly um, something that is developing now. Um, I wouldn't say that it's a lot of of uh, bees that are you know experiencing that, but it's a you know it's a technology that we're learning to use. Great, thank you. And, and how about yourself, Jason? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, we obviously overwinter um, inside refrigerated storage, and we kind of went along that same progression of uh, potato cellar unrefrigerated storage. And I think Brandon did a nice job of explaining um, some of the issues that happen when you can't really control your temperature very, very well, either too cold or too warm, particularly too warm, um, where we just weren't able to store as long as we're we're able to do that now. And so we're certainly see a lot of trending towards that. A lot of our neighbors. That are around us in North Dakota uh, are asking about, you know, renting space or space uh, that's available. So it's it's definitely on the increase. One of the things I think it got a little bit of a um, not not a bad name, but a lot of guys kind of tried it out with hoping that winter buildings and overwintering indoors would work like a great hospital solution. You could take sick, weak bees, you'd put them in there. You know, they'd heard good stories about 
the the great results coming out of indoor wintering. And so early on, I think this thought was sort of seeded that, hey, we can use these to fix bad, bad colonies or, you know, the, the, my neighbor's coming out looking great. I'll take my weakest stuff. I'll put it in for winter and it'll come out looking good. And that was the exact opposite of, of the truth that Brian just talked about and, um, and, and that we've seen. It's really the strong colonies that need to go in that are going to be the most benefited from this uh, indoor storage model. As far as other uses, um, we've utilized the building for uh, our building for, for a number of different things. We've tried the spring. So I'm, we really want to get to where um, what Ashurst are doing, where we're getting a good spring brood break. We didn't get our bees heavy enough this last spring when we went into our building. And so after about a week, we were we have scales in there that, that we're seeing the weights and uh, we were getting pretty nervous about it. And so our bees got so light that it took a while to turn some of those around um, and they were cannibalizing brood. And, you know, by the end, yeah, they were broodless, but they also uh, were in a tough way. And then they they didn't recover as quickly as we'd hope. So we've learned that lesson that you've really got to put weight into them in the spring if you're going to store them for, you know, 18 days would be great. But we didn't even make it past a week before uh, they were getting too light. So we have tried that, but we need to tune that that springtime model. Um, we've used it for weather issues where we're not able to move bees. Say, say we're getting bees into North Dakota in the spring from California or, or from Washington apples. Um, and we have weather events that don't allow us to move the bees as quickly as we'd like. And rather than going to holding yards for, for a longer period of time, uh, we'll just park semi loads in this building or offload loads into the building and then stage in there until we're able to move out till weather conditions improved. Uh, we've used it for comb storage. So keeping wax moth out, um, you know, it's expensive to refrigerate a building. I wish we would have partitioned our building. I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow when I talk about our building. Um, but, uh, but it's cheaper than losing, you know, uh, an entire load of, of comb because wax moth or, or other things, you know, got too warm and, and, uh, all the issues we've dealt with, with comb storage and dead out. So, uh, we've been using it more and more for that. And then, um, we've rented space one summer to a farmer who wanted to keep seed. They weren't able to get their seed in the ground because of weather conditions. And so they rented, they basically paid the power bill all summer for us to keep our, our comb in there and, and they rented the space. So it was kind of an unconventional rental. I don't know if that's going to work out, you know, year over year, but farmers in the area know that our space is available to rent and it's a great way to pay the very high expensive power bills through the summer. If you can. Wow. Oh, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, we got a lot of questions submitted about regional differences in using this practice, as well as timing of when to put bees into storage in the fall, early or early winter. And I wanted to direct that to Kirti and Gloria um, uh, and to comment on, and especially Gloria, I think you've done some work comparing timing of different regions. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did do a study before. Before I start, though, well, uh, uh, hopefully there's you know, people listening. I, ha I have to mention I misspoke about the nosema when I was talking about the nosema thing, and uh, there was a question: Was it nosema, nosema uh, serrani? And I said we didn't analyze it, but yeah, nosema, nosema serrani seems to be the predominant one when people do identify it over. The older uh, Nosema apis, which we already have, so uh, uh, I misspoke on that, and, I, and I, I wanted to make sure I cleared that up. Um, that, now, did you get back to it? Yeah, I mean, this comes back to what Kirti was saying, what Brent, uh, Brendan was saying about winter bees, and um, it doesn't seem as if um, once you know you're in these uh, more southern latitudes um, that that they have winter bees that you can actually put into cold storage to, that, that will be in cluster and make it through several months of confinement. And we did, we, we did as part of our study, uh, colonies that were down in Southern Texas, and we put them in cold storage. We looked at their fat bodies before we put them in cold storage and compared them with the ones in North Dakota. Uh, the fat bodies in the Texas ones look very different. The bees were rearing brood. Uh, at the time, we put them into cold storage, and they they just did terribly in cold storage. Uh, so yeah, moving bees 
from the south or the rearing brood. I mean, they're they're on a whole different schedule. And then putting them into cold storage, uh, it didn't go well for us. Great, thank you. And do you have anything to add, Kirti, just about regional differences or um and I know also as climate change comes into the picture, that could drive some adoption of this practice potentially. Yeah, I think um, uh, one thing I wanted to do is uh, just make a plug for the kind of models Gloria and others have been developing and you know, in and say that models have their limitations, but they're really good at addressing these kind of questions on you know, what regions might be hotspots um, for things to work well or not to work well um, and under changing conditions, because it's impossible to do detailed experiments, although you know that's the best way to do it. It's impossible to do it all over the US for all different conditions. So you know, using these models as a starting point to get rough ideas of where the timing might be best um, for different regions and then fine tuning and calibrating them based on real data that's collected, uh, you know, help in two ways. One, they help us identify where to make investments in lab experiments and learn more, and then just get more generalizable models that can work in larger areas. So just wanted to make a plug for that. Great, thank you. And I know one thing that comes up and, and we hope to help develop as well are not just those climate type models um, or disease models, but also economic models to help beekeepers make decisions if this practice makes sense for them and their operation. So I just wanted to put that out there. And let's take a question from the chat um, from Phil. Up here, in, and this will be open to anyone, up here in Canada where indoor wintering is standard practice, we are seeking ways to treat bees for mites and nosema while indoors. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there's been some work on treating mites while they're indoors. Um, uh, Robin Underwood, I think, as part of her graduate degree, published a paper or two on the use of formic acid while the bees are indoors. Um, uh, we did some work uh, funded by Project APSM using oxalic acid, but I will say that, you know, that specifically labeled, you know, that you're not allowed to use it indoors, you know, so it would require like label changes and things like that to use some of these products for Varroa while they're indoors. Um, and the the work from Canada, I mean, it showed some promise with formic acid indoors. I think, you know, it'd take quite a bit. I think for scaling it up, you know, scaling it up, and the idea of, you know, fumigating that much material in these giant buildings uh, poses probably a bit of a hurdle. But um, there's there's some potential. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the holy grail would be being able to treat the entire building or pull, you know, a load of bees into a building and and treat we'd all like to get there i do think that today part of what what makes it what brian was talking about um you know one you have to get your bees healthy before going in so if, so if they're really mite infested before you're going into the building you know that's um that's something that right now we we can't fix and so we need to get mite levels low before we get in there but coming out of the building uh, you're completely broodless, as as was shown, or nearly. You know, there there'll always be some big colonies that that are still rearing a bit of brood, but it's really the best opportunity to hit those mites with something that generally would be a fairly soft treatment, having a very large effect on on mite mortality is what we've seen. So I think that's kind of the magic of mite treatment with the building. Maybe the CO two thing, maybe fumigating, all of that would be fantastic. But where we are now, at least. It, it does lend itself to a very effective mite treatment coming out of that broodless state. Yeah, and along those lines, it's kind of fun to imagine the idea or, you know, the impact on like the ecosystem of the commercial pollination system to if you had all, you know, 500,000 or 600,000 colonies being treated and as they came out of the building in some mass way that when they hit the ground in California, they're all, you know, very, very clean for mites. And so you, you know, would eliminate a huge percentage of that sort of spreading mites around and, you know, 
neighbors infesting other neighbors and things. So it would be you know, cool to imagine like that, that impact on sort of the ecosystem down there in California. Thanks, Brandon. That's actually a great lead in to my next question. But before um, I get to that, I just also want to say, as Gloria was discussing in her presentation earlier with regards to NOSEMA, um, to test too and to be aware of your levels and, and her data was showing um, you know, that it's effective if you need it um, to treat before going into storage. Um, uh, Grace, I just was, well, I just want to address the Varroa question just absolutely. real briefly first, um, because I, I thought it was interesting um, on the uh, video, I believe it was on the video where, um, you know, they uh, bring those colonies in in August and, and essentially treating uh, for Varroa in August and, and um, you know, our field data and also our, our model predictions uh, um, showed that you know, by about the third week in September, um, that colony's fate is sealed. If it, in terms of if it's going to make it through the winter or not, if it's if it's you know going to go into cold storage or go into an area you know where there's going to be colony confinement, and so um, depending on when you put the colonies in 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 Canada, um, the, even if you had a treatment that you could use to put you know, in there while they were in th their their virus levels and and the damage those mites that you're going to kill have done is 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 already done. And so it, it's it's just it's just too late once you, once they get in there. From about the middle of August, about the middle of September is the sweet spot in most temperate areas to get get those colonies healthy. It's great. Get them mite cool, free. Yeah. Um, Brandon, you mentioned almond pollination, and one of the questions um, posed was, how does indoor storage optimize a beekeeper's operation for going into the almonds and almond pollination? So I don't know if um, Zach or Jason, you want to take a stab at that or, or anybody. Yeah, I think they would be better at how it optimizes it. I mean, I think, you know, Jason has some good points. I don't know if he's going to talk about it tomorrow, but um, I think it provides some opportunities for, you know, maybe reducing the number of times you move those hives a little bit and um, in preparation for almonds, but I'll let those guys talk about it. I go first. Go for it. Um, I think the the efficiency that is gained in having the bees inside um, a storage area where they can be accessed and loaded easily uh, enables us to do three or four times as much work in the, in the period that we have in order to deliver those bees. And so for large scale operations, I, I think it's, it's crucial. And our operation in, in fact has evolved now to be completely dependent on that efficiency. Um, and it was, you know, it wasn't an easy, uh, uh, process to, to do, but we're glad that we did. The, uh, the process of getting the bees out of uh, holding yards in California um, is so subject to the environment um, and the weather. So and being able to do that um, and control that trip and, and that, that shipping is really important. And then uh, Brandon touched on it. I mean, we're not moving the bees as many times. And so we're, we're saving money in terms of uh, getting that job accomplished quicker and easier with less trips, but we're also not putting the bees under quite as much stress. Um, and there's more to be said too about the fact that the bees are consuming a little bit less. We're, we're you know, getting some feed savings. That transfers over to pollination efficiency as well, because if you don't have um, the bees at their optimal weight, then that means there's more to be done while we're trying to deliver bees for pollination. So this, this really is important for us. Great, thank you. Jason, do you have anything to add? Yeah, without um, ruining too much of what I was hoping to say tomorrow, uh, one of the mm -hmm. things that that we have certainly seen is just the build up, the recovery of those bees um, is, you know, we, we will winter some bees here in, in California and bring them in and they may start off at similar strengths and the buildup of the California bees is a, just a very, very slow buildup. 
right? The bees that were indoor wintered that were completely broodless, that queen hasn't laid, you know, in, in months. When she hits the ground, she looks like, like this as far as her laying and brood, brood rearing. Now, obviously, that doesn't come on until a, a number of weeks after they hit the ground. So you can't plan that, you know, you're going to set them on February 10th and they're going to look great by February 20th. So we've had to adjust to moving um, bees in a little earlier. And we usually start that first week of January, getting 35 semi loads uh, halfway across the U.S. takes some time, but we look to have everything in by late January so that they have enough time to uh, rear that brood that, that she starts laying. And so the buildup coming out of the almonds is is a huge difference. And then from there, our ability to make splits and um, and and meet grade is just greatly affected. Uh, and the ability to, I think, swap brood across colonies. You know, we there just used to not be enough brood to really move a lot of brood to boost colonies. And these hives that are indoor wintered within a couple of weeks, they're just bursting with brood that you can really do a lot of equalization of hives. Great, thank you. Um, I think Josette Lewis from the Almond Board of California might touch on this tomorrow, but there's also been this idea of indoor storage, almost like as an insurance policy of healthy bees going in, you can feel pretty good. You're gonna get healthy bees coming out and often going to the almonds. Um, let's take another question from the chat. So Jay Berta says, I want to take my bees from my storage building at 41 degrees Fahrenheit and put them directly onto the truck to on a truck to Florida in January. Since they need to defecate, should I stage them for a few warm days prior to loading on the truck? And will I lose excessive bees in transit if I do not allow them to fly first? I know that's a specific question, but um, I think there's a couple threads there that some of you might comment on that's okay good yeah you got i was just gonna say zach and jason would know better uh, you know i didn't i didn't know a lot of guys in january go to florida I, um i don't know anyone doing that but yeah that's a pretty unusual direction but if we're if we're uh staging bees to to go over the road while they've been in storage we have to take into consideration the fact that there's a drifting potential. And so if you're gonna take them out of the cold storage and, and allow them that cleansing flight, that can work, but make sure that you, you don't put them in a, in a group or an area that doesn't have some structure or you know some trees or something to give those bees a, a way to identify their hive and then spread them out. Don't leave them in a big block. Um, and we've learned from experience that they come out quick after being in storage for any length and and then they um you know they really get lost so it's it's really important in fact i should add to that because it might help some people who are doing this process for the first time when when bees are delivered anywhere coming out of storage that initial cleansing flight is is so uh needed i suppose that the bees tend to just kind of bail out of the hives so we like to deliver the bees uh to their eventual locations as soon as they they come in we schedule trucks to be able to arrive in california for instance the evening after uh, the trip concludes so they they arrive in the evening and they are taken right out to the orchards where they're going to be utilized and they're distributed around that orchard so that they are in a setting that is very unique and not congested and that way we see almost no drift but if we stage them off of the truck into a holding yard, especially if it's just an open field, if you don't really break those uh, groups up and turn them different ways, you're going to see tremendous amounts of drifting, or at least the potential for that, and, and it can be a mess. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what, what Zach said, that one of the biggest disasters we had was unloading a semi in an open field in 80 degree weather here in California, and uh, having just crazy amounts of drift and, and a mess. The, the only thing I would add to that is um, don't look at the bees. Let the yellow rain come down for a day or two and don't look at them till about day three. So 
Um, you're going to be really anxious to see how do the bees look as, as soon as they hit the ground. I would caution against that. We, we try to always let those sit at least 24 hours, ideally even 48 hours on the ground. Uh, let it rain. Let them get oriented. Let that hive come up to temperature because you're going to be really kind of shocked and disappointed by what you see the moment they hit the ground. Nobody's going to be in the colony. They're all outside. And so it just gives you a very false sense of uh, there's no queen in here because there's no eggs, there's no brood, and there's no bees. It's dead. Um, so, uh, you know, it's the ultimate definition of colony collapse disorder being being viewed if you don't give it a little bit of time. So I would uh, just say, you know, two, three days before you crack that cover and you'll uh, have much better result than than getting after it right away, Say, like what Zach was saying. Great, thank you. And, and while we're kind of talking about these sort of specific scenarios, I'll take this next one from the chat. If the bees go back into the shed after almonds for the next 18 to 21 days to shut them down, do you have any idea how long it would take them to be ready for a honey flow after they get out? It sounds like Zach's been doing a bit of this. I mean, we did it there in Southern Idaho one time with about, um, with about a hundred colonies. Um, and so, and that, this was one of the biggest concerns was their honey production. And so we took those weight measurements and this would have been in the talk I gave last year too, but, um, you know, they ended up producing more honey than the colonies that sat outdoors. And I think, you know, this is probably a little bit dependent on the weather, you know, maybe in a year where the bloom comes on early and the weather's really great. Maybe the stuff sitting outdoors will, you know, make a little bit more, but it, and again, I mean, I think, you know, to like Kirti's point of these different regions and all that stuff make a big difference. So in that particular region, the 18 days, and then even in the loss of brood did not affect their honey production capabilities. And the reason I think the indoor stuff even surpassed the outdoor is just that, that health benefit and that same thing. I don't know that any, you know, I hear this over and over again about these bees coming from indoors is that they are like much more motivated and it, it's not very scientific to say that but they are like hungry and they go after it versus bees that have been sitting outdoors that are just like you know just putting along and so um they didn't seem to miss a beat as far as honey production for that period in that location but great thank you does anyone else have anything else yeah so we have a we have a model that we try to use and, and it has been a guide in more than just indoor wintering, but we've always believed that we needed to have three full life cycles, brood cycles um, before honey flow. And so we try to bring the bees out of the sheds again, you know, from the 20th of, of uh, April to the 1st of May. And we know that we need to have them ready for a honey flow here about the 10th of June in North Dakota. So we easily can get um, that period. And, and it's maybe a little different in other parts of the country, but I think the rule of thumb has always been that you need to have three cycles of brood before honey flow in order to be at maximum population with all of the generational support. Great, thank you. Um, speaking of regions, um, this was another question that was submitted, are we seeing um, this practice being adopted in new regions much? Um, I know we get a lot of questions about it, but do we, you know, are we seeing new beekeepers trying this? Obviously, Brian is a great example in the Imperial Valley of California um, adopting this within the last few years, but if anyone else can speak to just the adoption of this practice and new areas yeah um you know in northern california there's like buzz landon has just put in a, a building up there i i'm surprised honestly that the queen breeder region the golden triangle up there of chico um that there aren't a few more who are shipping packages and i think they're seeing the benefits every year uh, hikums and conans and all you know people are talking about how much they could see utilizing a building like this it's just the the construction cost and then the electricity costs and the regulatory hurdles of California 
um, have kind of tempered excitement in, in that regard. But I'm surprised that we haven't seen a little bit more up in that queen breeder region. And I think we will. I think Buzz is, is at the forefront of that and seen a lot of good results from his building, but he just kind of got that up and running last year, I believe. So uh, I expect it to continue. And, you know, California would be fantastic in bringing the bees here where they're ultimately going to be. You don't worry about the I-80 pass and uh, snowstorms and everything that slows you down and makes it difficult to get into California for the almonds. Um, but counterbalancing that with the cost and, uh, yeah, cost and headaches of California, I think has really slowed down that investment potential. Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the other area is that, you know, the Midwest, the upper Midwest area, I, I know that they're building some structures in, you know, Michigan and utilizing some, um, existing facilities there as an alternative to, like here, you know, on this side of the country, the alternative is to winter in Texas or California. And I think there, there's a lot of operations that winter in Florida. And I think some beekeepers are starting to see a benefit to some of this and winter there rather than going down to Florida. So I think that'll be one of the next big areas of adoption. Thanks, Brandon. And Gloria, did you have something to add? I was just going to say what Brandon uh, said. Um, I think Pennsylvania as well as uh, I mean these these areas are getting um, you know uh, extended flight into November and then you know in, in certain years, not every year, but certain years, warming up uh, and have those bees break cluster, you know, sometime in January or February. And and their overwintering losses are just, you know, really high. And then like Brandon was saying, those guys go down to Florida and Florida's not looking so good anymore. And so um they're they're thinking about cold storage. One um beekeeper in particular was building Megan Malbreth was was one who shared that and she probably should share more information about that uh putting a cold storage unit in so yeah um Grace I'm going to sneak in with a comment here um <laughs> and ask we we hear about all these um questions that researchers are trying to answer I know beekeepers are trying to answer the questions every year too you guys are both working with buildings and Zach, you have been done for a long time. What are the experiments you do each year to convince yourself that it's working the way that you need and hope? Do you set some outside and compare to inside? Are you segmenting your operation to get information each year about how it's working? And Jason, to follow up when Zach's done, I know that you run specific experiments every year and you might talk about some of that tomorrow, but what are the most pressing questions that you're taking the time to actually try to address in your own practice? Okay, thanks, Danielle. In the early years of our, our uh, cold storage trials, we were needing to be convinced ourselves that it was, first of all, a safe alternative, and then it, that it was economical and then feasible. And so in that order, we certainly didn't go 100% um, in one year. We, we tried a few and then a few more and gradually worked up to the point where we keep all of our bees that are pollination ready indoors. And we are convinced over that time with our own institutional experiments and knowledge that it, that it was the right choice. So we haven't been doing anything um, regarding the pre-pollination storage, which for us is usually about 60 to 80 days. Um, on the other hand, we have been learning to use the uh, refrigeration in the spring and keep the bees uh, after pollination. And we've done that in the same, same fashion. We've tried it with a few and then a few more. And now we've um, gotten to the point where we're using it for about a third of the operation. And we are anecdotally observing that the bees that are kept in, indoors after pollination are um, in many ways um, better um, throughout the year because we're able to get that um, brood break again in the spring and get a mite control that is really, really effective. And then Jason mentioned it earlier, there's a pretty steep growth curve that takes place after getting that hive broodless, especially in the spring when, when there's plenty of natural pollen available after they hit the ground. 
I mean, they take off like rocket ships and we see those bees do as well as the California splits that we make in terms of honey production. And generally um, compared to bees that would come out of the almonds and then be kept on the, on the ground, either in Idaho or North Dakota until the honey flow, they are better in terms of uh, overall varroa loads and virus issues and just as good as the splits in terms of honey production, better than the bees that are kept on the ground through that spring period in honey production as well. Yeah, we every year run in a couple of, of uh, experiments, it feels like, to, to see results. I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow, um, a number of them. But uh, I, I would say, you know, over time, we did the same thing. We grew into utilizing more and more indoor storage because we just weren't totally convinced. And, and every year we've uh, grown that to where at this point, it's virtually 100% uh, of our operation. As far as trials, um, you know, early on, we weren't convinced that that the food stores and pollen stores would be sufficient. So we were doing trials of feeding pollen supplement before going into the building and then or not. And for example, that bared out that we, we just don't feed pollen in the fall. There's a good enough flow um, going in and the bees consume with with the little bit of brood that's in there. They're just not consuming it in great enough quantity that we're really saw a difference, um, a benefit to feeding pollen in the fall. And so that was a huge cost saving, cutting that out. And the bees have fared quite well. And I also, I just feel that artificial feed is not, unfortunately in the bee world of nutrition, we don't have um, what we have in other animal areas. And so it's not, you're not feeding your bees, whether that's artificial syrup or pollen, it's not great stuff. And so if you can, if they can live off the natural stores, uh, the bees seem to do better. And so the bees have just done better working off of um, what what natural pollen has come in and they've stored as well as us leaving more uh, real honey in there rather than so heavily syrup uh, supplementing in the fall. So I think that's kind of some trials that we've had to get to that point of being giving up some of our honey production to have more weight, uh, natural weight in the hives and then relying on uh, the natural pollen to to really be sufficient and and that's saved quite a bit of money and labor in in cutting out feedings and cutting out pollen um and just relying on that shutdown of the building to you know they really don't require nearly uh the nutritional inputs that that they do when they're outside great thank you jason um Jason, you had mentioned queen breeders earlier, and we got a question, um, this is kind of for everybody, research-wise or just real-life experience-wise. What do we know about using these facilities for um, nukes and queen break banking? Um, we're usually focused on colonies, um, but what do we know about those uses as well, or are those future research directions? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've heard some stories. I think folks over in New York or on the East Coast are doing some uh, um, indoor banking or storage of nukes more so. I don't know anyone doing it over here so much. Um, I think the queen banking, I don't know of anybody really doing like banking their queens indoors. I mean, we did that work um, and showed that it's a, a real viable alternative to to banking outdoors, especially in California. Jason kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, I do think that's going to be an area of growth for those California queen producers. You know, we have at least one that's built a facility and um, I think a lot of folks are pretty jealous of it, but that summer period, you know, when the demand for queens goes down as folks are making honey and they're not doing so much requeening, those queen producers stockpile a lot of queens for sale in the fall and um it can be you know 114 degrees and no forage is pretty tough for banking queens you know to keep them fed and watered and all that and the, you know to be able to just put them indoors and and store them without that, that kind of um environmental pressure i think is going to be is going to look more and more attractive through the years as the conditions get more harsh Anyone anyone else have any thoughts about that? We've had a little bit of experience overwintering nukes in a five frame box and it's not ideal. 
um, when the nuke is, is big enough to, to substantially maintain cluster temperature, then it exhausts its speed supply really quick. And so um, our experience was that we had five framers wanting to starve. Um, and so we had to um, adapt to that. And we were adding combs of honey um, on the walls of those nukes in order to keep them alive. So if somebody's going to do that, there needs to be additional feed uh, sources for, for good sized nukes. And um, I see that as the biggest problem. And when you're disturbing the bees in, indoors, um, you know, it's, it's never a good thing. Um, any, any hives that are disturbed have more attrition than those that are not. And there's no way to feed hives inside without disturbing the clusters. And so there's gonna be some attrition um, in that process, it can be done. We were successful in overwintering nukes, but if they're too small, they, they don't seem to really do very well. Um, if they're too big, they, you know, they, they're gonna use some feed. Great, thank you. And I see a few um, contributions in the chat of folks who are aware of some others who are looking into these practices. So I'll just mention that so everyone can take a look. Um, uh, look at my question list here. Um, I was curious, and um, this is both from a researcher and beekeeper perspective, but your workers, your your lab assistants, your your bee hands in the field, what is the feedback that you're getting from the people using these facilities and, and working in and out of them, do they like it? Do they hate going into the building? Um, just any comments about the actual day-to-day -day use of the facility? I see Brandon's laughing a little bit. I was just laughing a little bit. I mean, you know, for the students or bee research, you know, a lot of times I think you sign up to do bee research in like the flowery fields of summer or something like that. And then the winter comes and you're supposed to be done doing bee work. And so then then I'm here like extending the field season to like the, you know, as long as possible. So then they're out moving bees and doing stuff in like, you know, the snowy freezing cold November. So I think that's the only like feedback I could think of as far as students or helpers and things like that, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe not as fun to do bee work in November as it is to do it in June or something. It's often a reality smack that comes along with your first field research project. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Jason or Zach, how do how do your guys like these buildings? Well, um, we always have a, a couple of guys. The loading takes takes a number of days, you know, or weeks uh, to get everything in and and get everything out. And so it is kind of a difficult environment in that it's it's cold, it's constantly cold. Um, it is the CO two, although we maintain it low relative it's much higher than atmospheric and so i do have some people who are sensitive as far as asthma or getting headaches whether that's due to just the dust um, and our building's really quite clean we're doing a lot of filtration but uh, even so just being inside uh, space you know i have guys whose asthma seems to act up more or they they experience headaches and why is that you know i, I don't know but um yeah, it's it's not the most pleasant work environment, but ideally we're not doing, as far as our winter storage, we're not doing a lot of work. I do think getting into that queening and um, making splits and all that inside the building, you're going to be doing a lot more work and headlamps and um, folks have done it successfully. But I do think I remember Buzz talking about how his employees were, on the one hand, really liking how well it went, how much they the efficiency of it and the numbers they could get out. But while you're in there actually doing it, fairly uh, unpleasant. You know, you're in the dark, except for red lights. It's cold. You're trying to minimize the exposure of the bees while manipulating. So it's a difficult environment to really manipulate bees in because uh, you can chill brood very quickly and uh, not being able to see, you know, hard to see queens, easy to make, make mistakes if you're doing actual split type of work inside the building. But man, the numbers they were cranking out, it was like four times the number of splits that we're able to do in a day with a smaller crew. So highly efficient, but not as fun. I partly included that question. Um, we 
we're going to have Brian here as well. In that video we watched during filming, it was about 104 degrees outside in the Imperial Valley. And he had specifically said that they'll use their buildings to get their workers out of the heat to do some of the bee work as well, which is a really interesting and unique solution. So, um, Let's see, so we're starting to wind down towards the top of the hour. Um, if anyone wants to put additional questions in the q and A, I I see um, from Pleasant Valley Honey, Brandon, can you describe more of the failure from your unstable building? Was it temperature, fluctuation, airflow, humidity, or other? The Nelson research from the 1970s suggested a range of two to nine degrees C was tolerable. Sure, I love talking about my failures. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I mean, I think the bees can take it, especially, but I'm assuming that was maybe more for the winter. So the, our case, you know, that I talked about today was for that brood break. Um, and so it was taking bees out of the, you know, the warm spring summer weather and kind of slamming them into that and so and the other major issue i think it really is that not necessarily the low temperatures but the swings in temperatures because the refrigeration was like so poor it was you know the two degrees was the average but it was um plus or minus five degrees you know so it was dripping down like below freezing and then it was like warming up and so um, it was really more just the swings in temperatures, probably more so than the the average temperature in that container. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's winter bees, you know, can handle a much colder temperature, um, certainly, you know, colder than two degrees. I think this week it's supposed to be, you know, a high of 10 degrees and we have bees outside and they'll, they'll be fine. But uh, for that brood break thing, you're taking bees for the summer and putting them in really cold containers with the wet with the temperatures going up and down didn't help but as you saw I mean some of them survived it was just it was really hard on them they were certainly weaker than the other ones um and so it speaks to having you know good temperature controls backup systems for your indoor storage facility all that yeah. and like Jason said I mean I think warmer temperatures are, are worse you know I think it would have been much worse if it was you know 15 or 20 degrees warmer than the sort of target temperature rather than being a few degrees colder thank you and um I know this can differ quite a bit but Hollyhock asks what is the size of the building um square feet per pallet of these If anyone has any recommendations. I don't know if that's specific to Brandon's building. I'll be talking about that tomorrow and, and have the numbers and all that for our building. Um, Zach, I don't know if you have those off the top of your head for uh, for yours, but yeah, I'll be presenting that. That'll be a reason to get you back, Holly, tomorrow. Yeah, and I want to plug tomorrow too, because we will also have a little bit more of a focus on the buildings themselves and some of their requirements, as well as different scales and sizes, including smaller rental units as part of our panel discussion. Um, so as we start to wind down today, I think what I want to do is just go round robin, and if you want to tell us about your future research, either your future research directions or what you want this audience or beekeepers to know about indoor storage. And then we can wrap up for today. So let's start with Brandon. Sure, I covered it in my talk. I mean, we're kind of interested in working on some more of that CO2 issue. So we have bees in those containers that perform so poorly that they now have new external refrigeration systems built by IVI, the company that's presented last year in those videos, um, retrofitted our containers. And now they're they're holding perfectly and beautiful and the monitoring systems all much better than it used to be. So uh, we have those trials going on right now. Um, and then the, my only comment was like, uh, Grace, when you summarize, you did a good job of summarizing, I think what Kirti had talked about. But like one of the things you said was like, you know, the, the colonies come out stronger. And I think for me, one of the things I saw in that is really they come out like more stable or, you know, they 
they're not as affected maybe by the spring dwindling. And so it, the way I see it is more as the as a stability issue and something that can be uh, counted on more. I mean, we can we never know what the like weather temperature is going to be over the course of the winter period. And um, you know, I've seen the southern Idaho, you know, sixty degrees or sixty five degree days in December, and those bees are flying. And so, if you had them yarded up outdoors there, you know, that could be you know, not good for bees. So I think it's that consistency predictability um that's super valuable and i think will become more important as the years go on great thank you and what about you kirti future research directions or what would you like beekeepers to know i think there's um two directions we've been exploring with Gloria and Brandon and Megal, Megan Milbrandt who's here and others. So one is, uh, you know, the work that we've done so far focused on the Pacific Northwest to um, just run the models for the entire U.S. and see um, what it looks like and where we need to collect more data and maybe calibrate the model better and um, and Gloria could perhaps speak more to that. And the second thing in terms of a climate change context is the question that came up earlier, how we can bring in um, results that better account for the natural variability around an increasing trend, which is really what we are focused on, which means you know, using different kinds of data sets. I think those two directions. Great, thank you. And I'll jump to Gloria next. Oh, kind of following up on, on what Kirti was uh, saying, uh, one of the uh, objectives of, of the Grand Challenge is to uh, build a, a map that would um, enable beekeepers to know when to put their colonies in cold storage based on, on their latitude. And so, you know, the, the output to, to the beekeeper would be really, you know, simple. Here's your, here's your ideal window. And it would be uh, based on when uh, you, you have winter bees um, in your colony, and you know, the, the uh, earliest possible interval, and some of that has to do with brood rearing when brood rearing stops and you have just sealed brood in your colonies. Um, but the you know question then is you know is, is what are the triggers to start making winter bees? As, as, you know, uh, Brandon was saying in his talk that we have all of these ways to describe winter bees. But what, what gets the bees physiology moving in that direction is still something we know very little about. And, and we have some ideas uh, on that in, in our lab and uh, that uh, I, I'd like to be testing next year. This year, we got a bunch of colonies in cold storage. Um, our Russian uh, beekeepers um, want to know if you can put Russian bees in cold storage. And uh, um, so we're working with uh, uh, a group that is uh, um, has Russian bees. They were up in North Dakota. We took half the colonies, put them in cold storage, put the other half down in Mississippi. Uh, we also have a group of European bees to compare them with. So they're in the cold storage facility now. They'll be coming out uh, January, end of January, and so we'll we'll measure them, see you know what they look like, how the Russians compare with the Italians. But um, it, it, not just how well they do. The, the payoff for the for the beekeeper is filling Russian queens in packages, and so it's how many package bees and queens can I rear from these colonies that are coming out of almonds versus me taking them down and having them just spend the, the summer in in Mississippi or the winter in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, you know, which one of those models is 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 economically you know is is more profitable? So. Um, we're that that's that's what the second part of that study is about is the uh, the economics of moving Russians into almonds versus down south for the winter if you're going to sell packages of points. Great, thank you. And I'll go um, to Zach next. I guess for for you and Jason, it's is there a research need that you see, or, and or what would you want fellow beekeepers to know about indoor storage? Well, I, th I think that I've already probably oversold it. For our operation, it's fundamental to our success. 
but it took a lot of development to get there. It's not something that an operation adapts to and, and experiences total success from usually in a year. It takes some, it takes some learning. Um, we're at the stage now where we want to know more about what's happening to the life cycle of the Roa mite in the storage, because we, you know, we know that bees that, that obviously are healthy that go into the storage come out looking great. And, and in terms of comparative uh, versus bees that are kept outside, we, we see that regardless of where the mite loads are, that they tend to be a little bit better. But what we don't have a handle on is why we see less Varroa coming out of the shed than we do going in. And we have verified that in our own experiments for several years. So is it just because those, those phreatic mites age or are they being kicked out? What's happening? Because we know that, that those mite loads on a, on a per hundred bee basis are decreasing inside the sheds in our bees. So in terms of learning about how this can be a more viable mite control tool for the industry, we want to know what is happening. And maybe there are people here on this, on this call, on this very panel that have better handle on that than I do, but it's interesting. Thank you, Zach. And Jason? Yeah, I'll try to end this here on time, so I'll be quick. I, I was going to echo Zach um, in that I think Varroa treatment, the ability to treat building wide or the most effective ways to treat um, pre and post um, cold storage is, is an area that has a ton of potential and tying that in with maybe multiple treatments, uh, multiple brood breaks throughout the throughout the year that we're going to work some more on our spring brood break and and Varroa um, control this year. So that's that's kind of one of our goals. I, we've got a few research trials that uh, and this is B research. This is not Brandon's this is not their level. This is what I call beekeeper research uh, that we do. So um, take it with a grain of salt, but a few things I'll talk about tomorrow. And uh, the other thing that always is kind of interesting to me is, are the queens, you know, we're stressing these queens in that she's outside and life is going along very well. And then slam, it's cold and dark for four months. And uh, on the one hand, she's got a finite amount of sperm egg production ability that you're conserving because she's not laying for this really long period. But how is that offset by the stress that she undergoes when multiple cycles of this shutdown, startup, shutdown, startup? And are we overall extending the life of queens or are we reducing the life? And where is that optimal? That's not something we'll be able to answer, but hopefully some of those researchers can um, tie some queen health and longevity to uh, indoor buildings. Great, thank you. And then I'm just going to throw it to Danielle to take us out for today. Jason got us out and now I'm going to blow it. <laughs> I can be quick and I'm boarding. I got a ticket home. So I just want to thank everyone. I mean, it's a pleasure to work with the researchers and the practitioners of this. Um, I thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, and for coming together to share your knowledge and perspective. I think this is really valuable to do on Zoom. So many people can participate now when we do it this way, but it's also nice to see everybody in person and I hope to see you guys uh, at meetings. So thank you everybody for, for making this come together. You know, we, we try not to make this just another webinar that's happening in the ether, sending people out to get these live tours and get these really up to the moment updates. It's, uh, we're hoping to make it as, as interactive and valuable a webinar and current as we can. That said, it'll live on YouTube before ever and get old. So, <laughs> but this is where we're at today, and I thank you guys for for sharing your information. Thank you, Danielle. Have a good day. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We will be here at eight thirty Pacific tomorrow. See you guys. Yeah. Bye.